All right, and so and it's at the end that we're gonna you're gonna ask about HR. No, I'm not gonna ask HR questions. No. Oh, okay. I was gonna say because my wife, um, I talked to her a little bit about that because she's doing her master's in public administration. Okay, I'll ask a question. Then. Oh, I was just wondering because um, you know, I was talking to her about it, and for me, I you know, I don't know too much about HR, so I asked her about it, and she's like, "It's a lot, you know. I'm taking classes in it. I'm getting my um, certificate in it." And she's like, obviously, you know, most people just think about the hiring and firing that HR does, but HR, she went into this whole spiel about like dealing with the legal issues and your, you know, your client or your employee complaints and just, it encompasses so much more than just hiring and firing and doing this to go along. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Ricardo Perez. Ricardo, are you ready to be great today? Yes, sir. Ricardo, thanks you for being here today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Ricardo grew up in a small town called Freer in South Texas, practically raising himself, and he barely graduated high school in 2004 and ultimately joined the Army in 2006. He served as an interman in a brand new unit on Fort Lewis, the 5th Brigade's 2nd Infantry Division, and was one of the first privates in the brigade. The unit deployed in 2009 as the first factory brigade to Afghanistan. And upon return, the unit deactivated. Ricardo voluntarily withdrew from a medical discharge ETS in October 2010. Using his job bill benefits, Ricardo graduated from Texas A&M University of Kingsville in 2016 with degrees in chemical engineering and chemistry and moved back here to Washington State not long after graduating. From there, things in his life took a twist, and now he is a recent graduate of the University of Washington's Master of Science in Entrepreneurship program offered by the Foster Business School. With a, with a memoir recently written, an involvement in a, ver- in a variety of new adventures, he has plenty to talk to us about. Plenty to talk to us about. Ricardo, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. No problem, Jason. Thanks for having me. So, Ricardo, talk about this twist in your life that you talk about in your bio. Yeah, well, you know, I graduated, you know, like the bio said, in 2016 with my degrees in chemical engineering and chemistry. And, um, you know, when I reached that point in my life, I thought things were going to get better, you know, a, a veteran and you always hear how companies want to hire veterans like crazy. So it's not uh, the truth though. <laughs> and uh, I was like, man, I just got two good STEM degrees and uh, a veteran. He did a bunch of research as an undergraduate. And so I thought like, Hey, you know, I'll be able to get a good job and finally be able to provide a good fam- uh, life for my family. And unfortunately that wasn't the case. You know, we moved up here uh, not too long after I graduated, my wife got a job offer from a school district in the Seattle area. And they had come to an agreement on um, the terms of employment, you could say, but it wasn't like, there was no paper trail. It wasn't done via email, it was done over the phone. And so when we moved up here, they ended up kind of going back on what they said they were going to pay her. And it was like, man, we moved all the way up here and you said you were gonna pay us this much and now you're trying to pay us this much, which she was making in Texas. It's like, man, that's what I was making in Texas and the cost of living is 10 times less over there. So you know, unfortunately, not going to be able to keep this job making the same as what I was in Texas. So, um, yeah, you know, my wife has her degrees in um, political science and English, and I have mine in chemical engineering and chemistry. So we had four degrees in the house, and we were, you know, starting to apply for work. And I was thinking, you know, four degrees, um, recent grads, we should be able to get a job. Veteran. And, yeah, and so um, thankfully, the VA had back paid me forty thousand dollars for uh, you know my disability claim and um and so yeah that money floated us over while we were looking for work and i didn't think it was going to take us you know five months and it actually took us seven months my wife got an interview with amazon at around the five month mark and by the time they actually hired her you know she had to jump through all the amazon hoops and by the time they actually hired her it was basically the start of month seven and uh, we were just about to run out of money on the verge of homelessness. I was already talking to military recruiters again, like, hey, you know, we're basically running out of options and there's no way I'm moving back to Texas. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to hop back into the military if I have to. So I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in the great Republic of Texas. <laughs> but where is for Texas? It is as far south as you can go, basically. It's like an hour from the border, about an hour from Laredo. And about... Um, you know, about an 80, 90 minute ride to Corpus Christi. Okay. So, so it's, it's basically south. right between smack dab, Corpus Christi and Laredo. Okay. About an hour from the border. It's so like, is it like right on the coast? 
No, not so much on the coast. It's inland a little inland. bit. Okay. But uh, yeah, small town, um, 2,500. My graduating class was one of the biggest in years. And we graduated with like mid 60s, 60 something students, maybe like 68. Okay. So you, you lived at like, like elementary, junior high, high school? Yeah. Um, I lived one year in Corpus Christi when I was younger, when my parents first divorced. I lived there with my grandparents. Um, you know, obviously my mom had just, you know, gone through a divorce with my dad and she went to go back, live with her parents and brought my sister and I along. And, um, and yeah, we lived there for a year and it was, you know, an interesting experience as a young boy. You know, it was uh, maybe like a four bedroom, one bathroom house. And there was probably like 13 to 15 of us living there. And so it was crammed. There's always fights going on. Like, I imagine. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. And so, um, yeah, it was just, you know, like I said, a weird experience. You know, that was my only year in, in Corpus Christi growing up. But other than that, I did grow up in that small town. Mostly grew up on a thousand acre ranch. Um, you know, all throughout my elementary years, I lived with my dad on the ranch. My junior high years, I lived with my mom in town. And then my mom, after junior high was done, she moved out of the town. And so I didn't want to leave. She wanted me to go with her. I was like, no, I, you know, I was a big introvert and afraid to try to make new friends and stuff. It's like, man, I don't want to go to a new school. Forget that. Like, I'll go back and live with dad. So at I'm the guessing ranch. a lot of horseback riding. Um, Cowboy stuff. I mean, not a lot. My uncle did have a bunch of quarter horses. He, he did quarter horse racing. So we did have, you know, he did have anywhere between 10 and I'd say probably 20 at most quarter horses. And I did ride him a handful of times, but you know, there weren't so much like you're just your regular ride horse, you know, there were quarter horse race horses. So like top, top breed horses. Yeah. yeah. So, or more or less, you know, probably not the, you know, your, you know, Kentucky Derby runners, yeah, but, but not a regular horse, yeah. not a regular riding horse. <laughs> yes, sir. So let's move forward a little bit. So you graduated with a mass entrepreneurship in the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would tell you the only way to learn entrepreneurship is to actually do it. Mm -hmm. Well, you went to school for it. What's your point of view on that? And yeah. when you do that, I'm going to turn on this light real fast. I forgot to turn on. Oh, yeah, question. no problem. Um, so I kind of thought the same thing, you know. I filed a patent for an idea that I had as a senior engineering student. And um, when I filed that patent, I was just like, man, I don't know what to do with this thing now. So I'm going to start reading a bunch of business books. So I started to read a bunch of business books. I started to do webinars, the SBA webinars. And thankfully here in Washington State for veterans, they have, um, they offer free business coaches for veterans. So it's pretty cool to, you know, have this business coach I can kind of talk to. And I didn't talk, I think I talked to them once before I found the entrepreneurship program at UW. But it was nice to know, like, I, hey, I had, you know, as a veteran, I had these resources available to me and a one-on-one -on -one business coach that I could ask questions about as I read through these books and try to figure this stuff out. And so originally I had applied to the, I think it's called um, EBV, Entrepreneurial Bootcamp for Veterans or something like that. And it seemed like a really cool program. I think it was like maybe, oh, I can't remember exactly. This was over a year ago, but it, it was a, you know, X amount of time. I want to say 10 weeks. And after the 10 weeks, they would fly you out to like, there's 10 universities across the U.S. that take place with this, in this program. And each university has their own specialty, like, hey, they'll fly you to you, this university if you want to know about franchising. And they'll fly you to this university if you want to know about customer, you know, consumer products. And so it seemed like a really cool program. I applied to it, and it seemed like they were interested. I did uh, get an interview for it. And then just kind of on the, you know, on a whim, I had been searching uh, veteran entrepreneurial benefits on or assistance or support on Google. And just on a whim, you know, during I think it was right after the new year in 2019, I want to say. Yeah. And I just Google searched um, Washington State entrepreneurial, you know, assistance. And so the one like the basically the first thing that popped up was the UW Entrepreneur Program. And I had already been like interested in using my um, my voc rehab benefits. And so I found this UW program, the entrepreneurship program, started reading more about it. It was a year long. And I was like, man, that's great because the voc rehab benefits are supposed to be for about a year. I was like, okay, it seems great. And I just read more and more about it. And it seemed like a good fit. So, you know, I took the, I took the shot and I applied and thankfully got accepted. And before I got into the program, like when I first applied, I didn't even realize it was with a business school. 
And so I was like, you know, when I applied, I'm just thinking over here, like entrepreneurship, this is going to be weird. Like, how do you learn entrepreneurship? You know, like basically like you were saying, like and, the only way to learn swimming is how you go swimming, right? Yeah. You yeah. can't learn swimming by looking at other people swim. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I kind of had that same thought. And I was like, well, it's maybe going to be a, a degree in basket weaving. But I was like, I don't care. You know, I'm going to get my veterans benefits. I'm going to get paid to go to school. And it's UW. It's a great university. And then I learned it was from the business school. And I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. You know, I didn't know it was going to be at the business school. And so, you know, when I started to look more into it, and read the, the coursework that you're going to get offered and stuff, you, you know, we got coursework in accounting, finance, negotiations, marketing, uh, strategy, um, leadership, just a whole bunch of different, you know, classes and all kinds of different workshops and, and things like that. So it was a great opportunity for someone like me who had zero background in business, like maybe who someone who has a, a bachelor's undergraduate business degree or something, you know, maybe they would, um, prefer to go to like an MBA program or something. But I think for someone who has no idea about business and has only dabbled in entrepreneurship just a little bit, it's a really great opportunity because you're going to learn a wide variety of topics and subjects that are going to help your small business. And not only that, you're going to get taught by like some of the top people in the world at their fields. The and, boss is like one of the top business schools in the United States, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great business school. And, um, and not only that, the network you're going to gain and the opportunities you're going to get by being able to compete in the business competitions and just doing to the different pitch competitions they do and the different workshops that they do. It was really, you know, by far probably one of the best things I've ever decided to do in my life because of the opportunities that it allowed me to kind of, you know, like, I feel like I wouldn't be here today without it. So I'm very thankful for it. So I want to come back in a minute, but first I want to ask you this question. And so, like, when you left the military, and this is my theory, like, there's all these veteran programs out there, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, sometimes I think there's too many veteran programs out there. It's almost like information overload. And, of course, like, a, a lot of programs are good, have the benefit of the veteran, and, and, you know, and, you know what they want. But I think there's a lot of programs out there, like, you know, I won't say scams, but, like, they're, like, kind of sketchy, right? Have you personally, how did you, how did you, like, maneuver all that stuff, like, getting out of the Army, figuring out what to do, what not to do, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's tough. You know, when I got out of the Army, I, you know, the unit I served in was, was pretty bad and hard hit. You know, we had just got back from Afghanistan pretty much. And uh, well, not me, you know, we'll get to that story later. But when I got out, you know, all I knew is that I wanted to use my GI Bill benefits because I was like, man, I get the opportunity to get paid to go to school. So it's like, I'm never going to have that opportunity again anywhere else. I might as well just take advantage of it. And I actually started um, going to school at Tacoma Community College while I was on, um, terminal leave before I even ETS. And so I started, you know, school at uh, Tacoma Community College. And it was really hard. I did visit, you know, while I was before I hit terminal leave, since I was just on rear detachment, I try to take a day or two to visit the local community colleges around uh, Fort Lewis and see like, which ones were going to be the best experience for me. And I'm glad I chose Tacoma Community College because they're, they really set me up for success. They're the best um, community college experience I've ever had. They have this thing called the MARC, the Math Advising and Resource Center. And that place is just a, a remarkable um, like um, tutoring center, I guess you could say, for students to go who are having trouble with math. And, you know, being a, a grunt after 10 years of, or I'm sorry, after five years of military service and almost, you know, 10 years of being out of high school, I n knew nothing, you know, I didn't know, and all I knew was how to send nine line medevacs and my battle drills and, you know, how to maneuver and do these other infantry things. And, you know, when I got out, I had zero knowledge of anything academic. And so it was like, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it. Um, Cause I've always been, you know, I've always enjoyed school, but I never really like thought it was going to be something I loved to do. And so, yeah, it was just, you know, a, a, it's hard, you know, because there are, like you said, a lot of places out there that are scammy and like, um, you know, I, th I think the biggest thing is to make sure it's not a for profit type of place. And you want to make sure they're accredited. And um, I think those are probably like the two major things you can do to protect yourself is make sure that it's not for profit and that it's an accredited institution. And not just like some kind of made up accreditation that, you know, they're partnered with this other shady organization to accredit them or something, you know, you have to really 
do the research and see what the actual accreditations are that are kind of like nationally recognized. You bring up a good point. I think so many people, not, not only there, but it's like people right out of high school, I also make a mistake, but maybe instead of, like you said, instead of going to like the University of Washington, a 40, 50,000 you know, member of school, mm-hmm. like class of three, 400 people, maybe, you know, to save some money, to save you and your parents some money, go to a local community college, right? I like the people, I don't think enough people look at that, that option. Yeah, definitely. You know, and I did the community college thing and, you know, when I graduated in 2004 from high school and um, I didn't have any discipline at the time, you know, I barely graduated high school. And uh, so when I got, you know, in high school, I was able to pass my classes without having to study, you know, just pay attention in class and boom, take the test, take the, you know, quizzes or whatever and, and, you know, pass the classes. And in college, it's not like that because you don't spend that much time in class. So you really have to take it upon yourself to study and work hard. And at the time, you know, I didn't have that within myself. It wasn't until after I got out of the military that I'm like, man, you know, I, I did gain the discipline that I needed. But I also decided like, hey, I get paid to go to school. I'm going to treat it like a job. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to. Some people think school is just a big party, right? Yeah. So, you know, at that point when I got out, I was like, man, I got this great opportunity and I don't want to slip it up. Because obviously you can get into academic probation and get your GI Bill you know, paused or canceled or whatever. And so I was like, man, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm going to just, you know, and I kind of regret it, you know, as a senior and um, at university, you know, getting ready to graduate as an engineer, because when I got out, I was just going to school with TCC and I could kind of, I did work to make sure I was getting relatively good grades, you know, but I could have put in a lot more effort at the time. I just ETS just came back from a deployment pretty much. And I was just happy to have my freedom back. I was just playing video games. And it was just like, you know, and then when I was a senior, I was regretting that because I was getting like B's and C's as a freshman and sophomore. And when you're a senior, you know, you really wish you could go back and get A's in those simple classes because when you're taking differential equations and thermodynamics too in these real serious senior classes, you're like, man, I need those A's to float me now, you know? But yeah, so I'd say... um, just the accreditation is really a big one because I always see people talk about that, you know, and you just got to make sure like for engineers, um, there for school or, or engineering schools, there is uh, what they call ABET accreditation. It stands for the Accrediting Board of Engineering and Technology or something like that. So, yeah, you just got to make sure like, you know, if you go to an engineering school that it's ABET accredited, you don't want to make sure, you know, because that's the national accreditation. So how did you transition from like, like a background in science and chemistry to being an entrepreneur? That's kind of two different fields, right? Yeah, well, I actually at Tacoma Community College, I started as a botany major because uh, I've always been interested in plants. You know, I grew up on the ranch and I did that talk for the Seattle Times and um, did all that plant ID stuff. So I've always been interested in plants. And when I got out, I was like, I'm just going to go for what I'm interested in, right? So I went to Tacoma uh, Community College for uh, botany as my major and I took one botany course before I had, you know, before I moved down to Texas, I did three, um, three of the semesters there at TCC. I almost got my associates there before I moved and went to university in Texas. But yeah, I started as a botany major. And when I moved down to Texas, they didn't offer botany as an, as a major at the university I went to. So I was like, Oh man, what am I going to do now? (laughs) You know, like I wanted to go to school for botany. So I thought about it and I was like, well, everything that plants do is based on chemistry, right? Well, everything that anything does is based on chemistry, pretty much. So I was like, I'm going to just go to school for, you know, I'm going to switch over to chemistry, and I can still apply that to plants. And then I started doing my um, chemistry coursework. And then as I started getting through it, I started to look more into like, hey, when I graduate with this chemistry degree, what can I do? And it was basically, um, you know, looking into it, uh, someone with their bachelor's degree in chemistry can basically be a lab gopher for someone with their master's or PhD in chemistry. And I was like, man, I don't want to be a lab gopher. Like I want to, you know, do something more meaningful than just be the guy who, you know, washes the lab wear and does the weighing of the, you know, the product or whatever your reagents. And so I switched over to chemical engineering, you know, I started to look more into that. And I was like, okay, chemical engineers can make more and more job opportunity, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I was getting ready to switch over and my chemistry professor, who I really um, have a good relationship with, she was like, oh, you know, why don't you just double major? It's only like six or seven more chemistry classes. And she's like, and I'll help you. You know, if you ever have trouble, just come to my office and I'll help you. And I was like, man, six more classes for two, another degree? Like, sure, why not? Let's go. That's, you know, that's pretty doable. Yeah. So I was like, okay, cool. 
So I picked up the double major. It took me an extra year to graduate. I don't know if I six more chemistry classes, though. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know, it did get a bit tougher in the chemistry curriculum as I got further along, but it was just an extra year, you know, basically, you know, three or four classes a semester to get that chemistry degree. And like I said, we moved up here to Washington, had trouble finding work. My wife got the job at Amazon. And, um, you know, I was in a bad spot because I had just busted my ass for 10 years, um, you know, basically five years in the military and then five years in at university and academic, you know, or the academia world. You're like, what is all this work for? What's all this stuff for? Well, like, not even it? that, but just, I mean, that was part of it. But a bigger part of it was like, man, I, I'm used to having my plate overflowing. And now I'm sitting at home taking care of my three and five-year-old. <laughs> And so it was just really hard because for a decade, I was kind of just pedal to the floor, had all kinds of stuff going on, especially as a, as a student, because I was taking 16 to 19 hours to get as much out of my GI Bill as I could. Um, I was doing research in the chemistry department. And when I became a senior, I picked up research in the environmental engineering department. I was doing uh, handgun classes as a Texas State handgun instructor. I was doing the work study for the vote, you know, the GI Bill work study at the local veteran service office. I was, I also joined the Army Reserve for a year. I served in the Army Reserve from 2013 to 2014, and I ended up dropping out right before I started my engineering curriculum because it was like starting to pick up my studies really significantly. And I was like, man, even these couple weekends a month, like really get into my coursework. So I got to drop this and focus on my studies. And so I had all kinds of stuff going on as an undergraduate and, um, and, you know, and on top of having a family and supporting my wife, who was a full-time student and eventually graduated and had to work and stuff like that. So, you know, it went from being busy all day, every day, having endless things to do to being at home with nothing to do, but watch my daughters. Yeah, that's a hard transition. Like, yeah. Like, like me, if you tell me I have 10 things to do and I week to do it, I'll do them all. You tell me I have one thing to do in a month, that one thing will not get done in a month, right? <laughs> yeah, and so it, that's what really made it tough. And that's when I filed that patent as I had a senior engineering student. You know, it kind of took me out of that slump I was in, in a sense. And, um, and so, yeah, like I said, I just started to research, like, the different, you know, entrepreneur programs I could do. And I found that one. And I was like, you know, if I get accepted, that would be really awesome because, it's a great school. Um, I would love to know how to do something with this patent. And so, yeah, I just kind of fell into that entrepreneurship. I mean, I feel like I've always been entrepreneurial, you know, even when I was doing my undergrad stuff, you know, I'd go to, you know, even while I was doing my, my handgun instructing stuff, I'd go to Walmart, see stuff on super clearance. I'll be like, Oh, I'll buy that and put it on eBay and make, you know, 50 or a hundred bucks real quick. And so I've always looked at, you know, any opportunity that I could and whichever way to make money. And I think that's what really kind of being an entrepreneur is about it's being able to create different streams of revenue for yourself in order to do what you want to do you know i guess that's a kind of like a broad simple definition for entrepreneurship i think because there are you know many different aspects of it you know some people consider themselves entrepreneurs whenever they you know leave their nine to five job and create their own plumbing company or something and that is entrepreneurship, no doubt about it. But, you know, there are people here in Seattle, you know, these major tech people think entrepreneurship is create this company, sell it four years later and make $100 million, you know. So there are different levels to the entrepreneurship. But in terms of just a broad definition, I think just creating streams of revenue for yourself in whatever way you can to get to wherever you want to get in life, you know, because not everybody wants to be the the venture capitalist here in Seattle making billions of dollars a year. You know, some people are just happy. They have a small business, yeah. lifestyle business, you want to call it, yeah. And one of the quotes we had in the program, I can't, you know, I'm going to butcher this quote, but it was basically like, if you can't take your idea with the VC and scale it to a $100 million business in five years, just take your business make $3 million a year and live happily ever after or something like that, you know? like I mean, Both of the win, right? Yeah, definitely. So let's go back to your high school years. Okay. Talk about how you first got interested in plants. And a guy who mentioned you, I don't know his real name, but his name, he went by Slick. Yeah, Slick, Mr. Eddie Earwood. Yeah, so uh, my high school years, it was really tough. 
you know, junior high was tough too. You know, I think everybody wishes they were invisible in junior high for the most yeah, part. Everyone, like, one thing off the top, like everyone hates junior high, right? But no <laughs> one's changed junior high. Like I, I, why, someone go change how junior high operates, right? Everyone <laughs> hates it. Even the public kids hate it. You know, introverts hate it. <laughs> everyone hates it, right? Teachers hate it. Parents hate it. But no one changes how junior high operates. I never understood that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are some places that do it differently. Like I've, you know, met some places that, I can't remember who I was talking to recently, but they were like, we don't have a junior high, like elementaries from kinder to seventh grade and then high school is from eighth to senior or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. But yeah, so junior high, you know, I've lived a pretty traumatic life my whole childhood, you know, basically since my parents divorced when I was about six years old, I've, you know, for the most part raised myself other than obviously being able to provide food and shelter for myself as a young kid. And um, so in high school, I just moved with my dad. He was a really bad addict at that point. I mean, he had been a pretty bad addict for all the years prior to that. But at that point, he was really basically getting to his peak where he was about to fall off. And um, and so, yeah, I was, you know, I had free reign to do whatever I wanted to do in high school. Like I could go and come as I pleased. I um, my freshman year, I should have brought my high school transcript with me. I just um got it for my book, uh, you know, to throw some more facts in my book. But um, unfortunately, they they don't give you your, your attendance record. They only have your grades, right? Historical, they keep your grades, but not your attendance record. But from what I remember in the morning, my freshman, my morning classes, my freshman year, because the way high school worked, whenever I went to high school, my freshman year, or all of high school, we had our morning classes. At lunchtime, it was off campus lunch. So we could leave campus, go wherever we want, do whatever we wanted to. And then, of course, we were supposed to come back for our afternoon classes. Supposed to come back. Yeah. <laughs> and so, the honor fre- system. <laughs> and so, our freshman year, you know, I maybe had like 15 absences at most, you know, in the morning classes. In the afternoon classes, I had like 30 to 40 absences because I would just leave with friends and not come back. And we would just go smoke weed, go play video games, just do whatever that we wanted to do. And, um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I failed a bunch of easy classes my freshman year. I think I failed like home ec and just like random classes because I wasn't showing up. And so my sophomore year, I just kept on planning on doing the same thing, right? Like I, I don't care about school. I don't care about anything. But growing up on the ranch, I had always been interested in plants for whatever reason. Because my, you know, my dad, he did take me hunting. And that was one of the few things we did to bond together. But that was like the the extent of our father son bonding time was shooting guns and hunting. And so he knew about like, Hey, that's white tailed deer. Hey, it's a cottontail rabbit and road runners and the javelina or collared peccaries and, and all the, you know, the different wildlife in the area, the quail and stuff. But I always wanted to know about the plants. Like, yeah, that's a mesquite tree. And that's a, you know, the handful of plants people knew, but I wanted to know like, Hey, what kind of, this is grass, but what kind of grass? And these are trees, but what kind of trees? And like, basically, I was thirsting for this knowledge my whole life. (laughs) And so um, freshman year, skipped a bunch of school, didn't care about anything. Sophomore year comes around. And finally, I can take this ag class because they didn't let you take an ag class as a freshman. And so I took this ag class. And on every Friday, our teacher would go and grab a bus because he had his, I think, a class B CDL or something. He'd go grab the bus from the bus barn and load us up for the, you know, uh, for class, like, Friday's class was, hey, we're going to go run to the convenience store real quick, and we're going to go look and identify plants. And so it was like the greatest thing in the world to me. Like, I was not going to miss Fridays at school for sure. You know, I was going to be there. And so it didn't take him very long to notice, like, hey, I had an interest in it because I was always asking and following him around. Like, of course, you know, there's the students who don't care about the stuff who are just there drinking their sodas and eating their chips, kind of just staring at the sun, you know, doing their own thing. And I was just there following him like a hawk, like, hey, what's that? What's that? What, you know, tell me more and like listening. And uh, yeah, it didn't take him long to realize like, hey, I'm interested in this. And he told me about that plant identification competition. And so I was like, yeah, cool. You know, I'll give it a shot. And he was like, it's the hardest competition. You know, I don't know if you can handle it. You know, that's one way he always kind of tried to motivate us, you know, by kind of being a a smart ass in in some sense. He's like, it's the hardest competition, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't care. You know, it's about plants and I want to learn about them. So let's go. And yeah, it's kind of how I fell into it. And he, you know, of course, to compete in the competition, I had to start passing my classes. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll show up and pass my classes now. So he essentially saved me from being like a high school dropout because on the trajectory I was headed, you know, I didn't care about anything. And my dad 
didn't have the focus or care in his own life to worry about anything. So yeah, that teacher, Mr. Yeti Earwood, I definitely owe him my life too. Cause I, you know, he really started off um, early on kind of showing me what I was capable of. Cause at that point I had never had a mentor. Like he was my first real mentor and um, you know, I never had any kind of guidance or mentorship. And so to have him there being a, a mentor at a really critical time in my life, you know, I think high school, those, you know, later childhood developmental years where you're going through a lot. Um, I mean, obviously, there's like so many kids that commit suicide these days and the, the, the female suicide rate for young, you know, for young ladies is like exponentially growing and compounding. So, you know, those are really tough years as well. You know, obviously, junior high, everybody, you know, for me, the hardest part was, and I think this goes for a lot of people, you know, everybody cares about what people think about them. And so, you know, as a young kid, you know, you're always worried about that. And that was like my biggest fear for in high school. Like I played sports and I only played one sport a year because it was hard enough for me to do one sport a year because it's just like being able to make practice was hard because like I didn't have any support, right? My dad was not going to take me to and from practice on a regular basis. So doing anything was hard. And uh, basketball was kind of like my sport that I was really good at outside of the school system, right? That's street ball. I was a good street baller, but when it came to like organized basketball, I had never played organized basketball until high school, right? I didn't play in junior high. And so to like be able to do that was like, and like to have the ball in my hand and know that the whole stadium was watching me was like the most nerve. Like I couldn't, it's like, I don't know if you watch the UFC and they talk about the UFC fighters, like, man, there's these guys in the gyms that are world beaters. They could beat UFC champions in the, the gym. On them is kind of yeah, but once the spotlight's on them and all the eyes are on them, they can't perform. That was basically the definition of me in, in playing basketball in high school was like, I was a really good basketball player, but, you know, I didn't have the underlying fundamentals of how to play basketball or any of the rules on how to play. And so it was just really a big mess. So but, talk about this competition that y'all entered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it was just a plant ID competition. Um, you have to be able to identify hundreds of Texas range plants, um, you know, all the different trees and shrubs and grasses and weeds. And, so, and you had to take a lo- like a long ass bus ride to somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the competitions were all over the state, you know, and finally for the state competition, it was in Lubbock, which is about a seven or eight hour bus ride from the far south, you know. And so, um, yeah, the competitions, you know, we just went around and we were doing really well because the two other guys that, you know, my first year on it, those two other guys were seniors and had been doing it their whole life. One of them was Slick son, you know, Mr. Earwood's son. So I'm sure he'd, you know, been taught all this plant stuff his whole life growing up because his dad knew it, you know. And then uh, his one of his best friends who were always together and, and Mr. Earwood always, you know, teach them stuff. I mean, they were together since like 4-H, you know, since the youth kind of agriculture stuff. So. So yeah, we just did those competitions and um, drove to Lubbock for that state competition. And man, I was really nervous. You know, there was a lot riding on it because it's a long trip. Going as a lot of think about. Yeah, and it's a a, we, it's a competition where you're supposed to have a four man team, and they drop the lowest score. So they take the three highest scores of the four man team, and um, and so yeah, we only had three people on the team, so there was no scores that were going to be dropped. And it was like, man, I got to really do well, you know, because I got to you know can't let these people down and. So I was really nervous and, um, and I was like super nervous. I'll never forget how nervous I was. You know, it was my first kind of big show I've ever done, you know, a state competition for anything, you know. And uh, when I flipped that first plan over, I knew everything about it, man. And I was like, I got this, yeah, you know, yeah, and I'm, I just like, I'm golden. This yeah. Is, this is cake. Yeah. So it just kind of taught me early on, like, how you can have those butterflies about something, but as long as you prepare and get ready, like once it's time to, to show up, you just operate, you know, you just do what you were trained to do, you know? And it's kind of like, kind of cheesy to say now, because I think about that in military terms, but you know, it was no different as being a sniper. Right? I trained really hard for a sniper to be a sniper for three years. And then I deployed to Afghanistan. And when I was in Afghanistan, I really didn't have any, um, anxiety going out on mission because I was like, man, I can't control anything that happens out there. I got to trust in my training, go out and do my job and hopefully come back. And uh, the anxiety just really came from coming back from missions rather than going out on them. Cause like, it was no problem for me to go out and do my job. But when it time to came, come back to the fob or to the, the cop, it was like, man, now I got to come and deal with this leadership who 
doesn't care about their soldiers, you know, and it was just like, man, just a headache. They're trying to make my life hell. So it was just kind of a weird place to be right in a war zone, but yeah. getting more anxiety going back to where it's supposed to be safe than it is going out to actual patrol and stuff. And Slick stayed involved with you a lot because I think didn't he like go to your college graduations also? Yeah, yeah. You know, I still talk to him um, periodically. Um, I did invite him to my college graduation because you know I did want him there. Uh, like I said, he is a major part of my life, and actually, he was the one who kind of encouraged me to go to school because when I moved from here back down to Texas, um, I really wanted to get into the oil field, right? I mean, these guys who dropped out of high school were making, making six money. figures plus. Yeah, and like man. They're may, maybe working 80 to 100 plus hours a week, but they're making six figures a year. And I just want to be able to, you know, invest some money or, you know, get something, get, not have to worry about my truck being repoed and stuff like that, you know? And so um, I tried really hard to get into the oil field and I couldn't get in. And boy, I basically got to the point where I went to a temp agency. And um, through a temp agency, I finally found somebody who was going to get me an in to the oil industry. And they were like, yeah, they were going to send me, uh, I was going to work for Halliburton as a uh, truck driver. They were going to send me to Oklahoma to do truck driver training. So I went to the temp agency, met with the lady, talked to her. She showed me like the little pamphlet and stuff, told me what I'm getting ready to do. And then she told me, like I had just discharged um, this, you know, maybe a year earlier at most, you know. And she told me, oh, you know, we, we really love veterans because you guys, like in the oil field, you're going to be away from your family and veterans are used to that. So we really love hiring veterans for the oil field, blah, blah, blah. And like that really struck a nerve with me. You know, it really kind of hit me deep. Like, man, I just had my daughter. My daughter was maybe six months old and I waited to get out of the military to have kids because I didn't want to, you know, something to happen to me or have to deploy for a year and miss all that stuff. And so when she told me that, it really resonated, and I thought hard about it on the drive home. And when I got home, um, I don't know if I called Slick that day or maybe you know later that week or something, but I had talked to him, and I was telling him what I was thinking about, and he told me he is like, you know, he's like, son, you should just go to school because the oil field will always be there. He's like, the oil field will always be there, but maybe your opportunity to go to school won't be. He's like, so just go to school. I was like, hmm, I never thought about it that way. So I was like, yeah, okay. And it's kind of like, you know, in, in the same terms of like entrepreneurship, you know, you can always go get a job, right? You should take whatever risk you want to take and do whatever is pulling at your heartstrings and, and like that you feel passionately about. Because if you try it and you fail, you can always go back and get a job. You can, there's always going to be, you know, it's harder to say in the coronavirus time, but <laughs> prior to this, you know, you, there's opportunity out there for someone to hire you all the time. So yeah. Take risk on yourself. So I got a good story for you, right? You, you, you'll, you'll appreciate this. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in the sixth grade. I'm in a, a Page Junior High School in South, South San Antonio. Me and my friend Patrick Norman, we skipped school for 12 straight days. Wow. <laughs> Doing things not supposed to do, right? And finally, we were like, man, we got to go back to school, right? So we went to school and across the way for us, our punishment was three days suspension. So on top of 12 days skipping, they gave us three extra days off, right? <laughs> and I'll never forget that, right, Amy? I lost track of Patrick of course. I one of my good friends, like two twelve days just like going like just movies, movie parks, sneaking everything where. And I, I remember that story to the studio story, like twelve straight days and punishment was three days off. Like, we don't want to deal with you and Patrick. Like just stay away for three more days, right? <laughs> uh, that, that was craziness. Yeah, and for me, you know, from all that school that I missed my freshman year, when I became a senior to graduate high school, they were like, You have to do detention. You have to do detention to make up for all the school you missed as a freshman. And I'm like, man, like that sucks, you know, because the tension just encompassed you showing up to the cafeteria and sitting there with the um, probation officer. Uh, I think it was he was the probation officer anyway. But yeah, you just sat there twiddling your thumbs. And of course, they wanted you to work on your homework if you had homework or whatever. But, you know, it was just really weird. I had to spend a couple of weeks, I think, in detention or not like, you know, maybe two or three hours a day for, you know, two weeks or something yeah. or for whenever days they held detention. But yeah, so I had, and it was just really weird to me. I'm like, wait a minute, like, this is a really weird punishment, making me just sit here, do nothing for essentially doing nothing, you know? So yeah, I, yeah, I can resonate we, with you we, on we that. We got our friends, you know, we respect back then, you know, they still like, what's called paddle, they still paddle students. We respect like, we're going to get like, one, one strike each day. We skip <laughs> something like 12 strikes, whatever, 12 paddle. He's like, no, three days, you know, see you on next week. We're like, what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about, uh, I think you were invited by the Seattle Times to speak at something called the um, Ignite 
education lab? Yeah. Um, you know, I got to give a huge thanks to them too, because they're really the ones who pulled me out of that deep depression I was in. Um, when we moved up here in 2016, like I talked about earlier, we had trouble finding work, went seven months without it before my wife got that job at Amazon. And man, I gained like 40 pounds during those seven months because I was just, and I was drinking like crazy. It was bad. Like, it's probably the most depressed I had ever been since my service in the military. And, you know, I was drinking a lot and just so depressed because like applying for jobs is so soul sucking, you know, like it's this long, painful process. You know, you're going to spend at least 30 minutes to an hour minimum on an application. If, if you really want the job, you know, you're going to spend 30 minutes to an hour minimum getting your resume, your cover letter, all this stuff, making sure you're hitting the keywords that they want and the job listing. And so it was a soul sucking process. We would wake up, eat breakfast, get done with breakfast, apply for jobs, make lunch, eat lunch, apply for jobs, make dinner, eat dinner, apply for jobs, or maybe play a little bit of video games to unwind at the end of the day. And um, yeah, just like the days were just starting to blend into each other because it was wake up, apply, you know, eat, apply, eat, apply, eat, apply, eat, sleep, eat, apply, eat, apply, eat, you know, and it was tough. And uh, in the December 2017, when we were going through all that, I saw that the Seattle Times put a post. Um, oh, man, I'm sorry, that was December 2016. In December 2016, the Seattle Times made a post about like, hey, we're doing this Ignite Education Lab. If you have a story of how education changed your life or deeply touched you or something, you know, write us or call in and tell us your story. So I called in, spoke on the phone to a machine for five minutes and told them my little story about Slick and Earwood and how he saved me from being a high school dropout. And I never heard anything back from them that year, 2016. So I was like, man, you know, that's a bummer. So 2017 comes through. We're, you know, going through that whole process of I'm trying to get work or we're trying to get work and unsuccessful. Finally, you know, we're living in this tiny apartment in the third, you know, the third floor of this tiny apartment. And I was like, when I got out of the army, I was like, I never want to live in an apartment again. Because for what you pay for an apartment, you can pay a couple hundred dollars more and rent a house. So I was like, oh, I never want to live in an apartment again. So we were back in this apartment, basically, like, due to the circumstantial kind of situation we found ourselves in. And so I was like, oh, it was just the most mind numbing thing ever to live in this tiny place with my two young daughters and all their stuff and, and all our stuff and the dog that we had just got because, you know, wanted to get them a dog. And so it was tough. And then I did that stuff with the Seattle Times. Nothing came through of it. 2018 started to roll along. It ended up being crappy. Like basically all of 2018, I was depressed too. Cause even so not a good year for yeah, you. Yeah, not at all. So even whenever we moved out of um when we moved out of that apartment into a house, the house we live in now, it's the nicest house I've ever lived in by far. I mean, it's got a second story, it's got three bathrooms, it's a three a car garage a nice backyard with a big playhouse for my daughters to play in. It's like, you know, and really in the nicest house I've ever lived in. And I, it was so weird because uh, I was still depressed. Like even though I was out of that tiny apartment, had all this space, I even felt like a stranger. It was really weird when I first moved in. It felt like really surreal. Like, man, I don't feel like I belong here. And um, so it was like this really, you know, painful process. I was still depressed. And um, my wife, was going through her heart. And then like when my wife got that job at Amazon, I basically became a single dad, which made things harder for me too, because she was because of the commute to, with Seattle traffic. She was gone in the morning before we, we woke up for breakfast. And she was usually home after dinner. So it was like, you know, we didn't see her that much, you know, and then when she got home, she was tired, she wanted to go to sleep, get ready for the next day. So I was basically a single dad for a year while she worked there. And my depression just kind of went on and on. And uh, even though she left her job at Amazon and things got better for her, um, I stayed depressed until later that year in, in 2017. And then the Seattle, like, it was early December, I want to say. My daughter got sick. It was her first year of kindergarten, right? She just got into school. It was her kindergarten year. She got really sick with pneumonia. And um, yeah, she was like six years old, pneumonia? That's yeah. kind of unheard of, right? I'm usually, like, older, older people get pneumonia. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it was kind of, it was weird because like she got sick with a cough, pretty bad cough. We took her to the minor emergency. They're just like, oh, you know, it's, 
the flu or something's going to pass, you know, no big deal. We take her home. Nothing's getting better. We take her back. I think we took her back twice and they're like, no, it's this good. You know, she's fine. And then finally, like, she's like, I felt like she was dying. Like the way she was coughing, like coughing her little life out. Basically. I felt so bad. And that, that was the straw that broke my back. Right. Cause I was so depressed from everything else. And then to see my young daughter in kindergarten, you know, this young five-year-old, my five-year-old daughter, like so sick. And I think she even asked one time, like, am I going to die? <laughs> like, she was like so sick. We're like, okay, like this is not right. We're gonna take her in. Like, so finally, the third time, they check her oxygen. Her oxygen's low. They're like, okay, we're gonna X-ray her chest. She had, you know, a bunch of the pneumonia, the the liquid in her chest. And they're like, man, you know, like you brought her just in time. They're like, we don't think she needs to be hospitalized. So we're gonna send you home with a bunch of antibiotic. And you know, if things don't get better, she's gonna have to go to the hospital. So we basically caught it like right at that moment to where like, man. If, if you would have waited another day, she'd probably be in the hospital. And so I was broken. Like, man, that, that really, really broke me. And um, I was just sitting in my garage thinking about life in general, you know, just one evening, just thinking about everything. And um, I just decided, you know, for her sake, I was going to start faking it. You know, like, cause I, you know, my wife had even been telling me like, you need to change your attitude. You're always mad. You're always pissed off. You're always depressed, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I knew it, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, but life sucks, you know, and whatever, whatever. And so, um, and so whenever I was sitting down in the garage thinking about everything and I was like, you know what, I just need to fake it till I make it or just fake it for now until she, at least till she gets better. Right. Because while she's really sick with this pneumonia, it doesn't do her any justice or any good for me to be depressed and pissed off or, you know what I'm saying? To have this cloud of horribleness following me around or she's basically, you know, on the verge of hospitalization. And so I, you know, it was really weird because I was sitting in the garage thinking these thoughts. And I was, as I was thinking these thoughts, I almost felt the world around me change. It was so surreal. Like, I felt like a weight was being lifted off my shoulders. Like, it was really weird. And so I was just having these thoughts, doing my own thing. And like, no shit within a couple of days, maybe by the end of that week, the Seattle Times had reached out and they're like, hey, we still have your, your submission from last year that you did. Like almost a year afterwards. Yeah. Are you still interested in doing it? I was like, hell yeah. You know, because like, I need something to do, right? I'm depressed. And so it was just kind of weird to me. Like, how, man, like so crazy. Things line up sometimes, huh? Yeah. It's so crazy. Because like, if they would have taken me that year, I still would have gone through that whole like unemployment stint and still would have been depressed. So it was just really weird to me how it played out, right? Like they passed on me that first year, but were interested enough in my story to ha invite me the second year. And so, um, so yeah, I was like, yeah, great. I'd love to do it. And so from then on, I had uh, about five weeks to get ready to give my talk. And so yeah, I had something to work time, on. Like, public speaking? Or you had done public speaking before? Oh, no, he no way. <laughs> first time doing it? Yeah. And um, so how do you handle that, you know, in doing your first public speaking? Like, you, did you just study a lot of YouTube videos and learn how to do it yourself? Or? Um, well, I mean, I had done it in, um, in university, right? I took speech classes yeah. and I'd done presentations of chemistry stuff. So I had but nothing like this. Though. Yeah, no, I had done public speaking in a sense. And of course, my handgun classes, right? I'd have strangers come and take my handgun class all the time. But for me, public speaking, I don't have a problem pu public speaking. For me, when it, become times to come, um, when it comes time to speak in public, it's hard for me to do when, it's just, when I'm trying to talk about something I don't know about, right? Because then like the crowd is going to know, like they're going to get that kind of vibe from a speaker if they're trying to talk about something they don't know about, right? So, so yeah, it was a little bit nerve wracking for me to think like, hey, I'm going to be standing in front of hundreds of people, right? This was definitely going to be by far the biggest crowd I've ever stood in front of to tell a story. But I just knew that if I, you know, prepared um, the best that I could, that I would, you know, go up there and perform. So, you know, over those five weeks, I was always just, you know, with uh, some, you Holding know, the mic. yeah, and just memorizing my story, memorizing my story, working on the slides that were going to be shown with it coming. They gave us uh, three, two or three coaching sessions with like a professional oh, speaking good. coach and stuff like that. So yeah, the Seattle Times did host us a few times before the event for coaching sessions and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a good opportunity. And um, but yeah, public speaking is hard whenever you're just kind of trying to wing it, you know? Yeah, some people can do it like wing it. I can, I can never do it. I yeah, it's hard to wing practice, it. But yeah. like, yeah, if you've got something prepared, it's not so bad to get up and talk about. And it's like kind of the same thing in the military. You know, it was really the military that brought me out of my bubble because you can't be in a bubble in the military. You're going to have to learn how to 
voice your thoughts and tell people like, Hey man, that's not right. You know, and, and do certain things. So the military is what really, like I said, showed me to myself because it wasn't until I made the sniper team. Um, cause like growing up on that ranch, my whole life, I wanted to be a sniper. It was my th three things I wanted to do growing up, be a sniper, be a fighter pilot and be an astronaut. Those are the three things I wanted in the whole world. And so to make that childhood dream come true after a 65 hour a rigorous tryout for the sniper team I was like man I can make anything happen you know if I can make my childhood dream one of them come true I was like man I can make any of them happen at, at this point and so yeah the military really showed me to myself and really opened me up to not be such an introvert and keep my mouth shut all the time so yeah have you have you, have you finished writing the book born or fail you start writing it um I Comes have a, it's like 99 percent done there are a few things because I, I did, you know, I wrote the book. I finished the book, essentially, it's, it's, it's or I finished about your life pretty much. Yeah, you know, I because I didn't know what I was doing when I first started writing it. I just kind of did it to. um. Well, is it is it OK if I back up a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did that Seattle Times talk when I got done with it. I was like, man, what am I going to do now? You know, like I pulled myself out of this deep depression with the help of that. But now I don't have that anymore. And if I don't do something, I'm going to go back into that hole. So I was like, man, I need to just do something to keep my mind and my hands busy. So I started to do a mechanic work. I started to just work on my vehicles at home, change all, you know, do whatever with those. Started to do um, sewing. I started to pick up sew work. I bought a $40 sewing machine off offer up and started to do alterations because my wife is four foot 11 and basically anything she buys needs alteration. And so I started to do alterations for her just trying to do anything to keep myself busy the way I had always been prior to this kind of hiatus of applying and becoming a stay at home dad. And, um, so in 2018, one of the guys I served with in my company, he lost his life to a very rare form of cancer. From what I understand, less than a, less than a thousand people have ever died from this cancer. Like total, like in the total of the ever world. in the history of known man is so super rare. And when I learned about all that, I was like, I couldn't believe it. All right. It just kind of blew my mind. Like, wow, 26, 27 years old, one of the rarest forms of cancer ever. So I went through back in my mind, my first experience overseas with bottled water and it took me away and I'll never forget it because we got to CAF, right? Kandahar Airfield, Southern Afghanistan. And all I see are, well, first off, all I smell is that poo pond, right? <laughs> but then after that, you know, you start to drive around and get upwind of it. So it, you know, things change. But one thing that doesn't change is there are nothing but pallets of water out in the sun. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, we spend trillions of dollars on this war, but we can't even shade our water for our troops to drink. And so it was really hard to enjoy water there because it all tasted like leaching plastic chemical. It was horrible. So I would spend time at a pallet. I'd grab something from the tap pallet, take a sip, taste the chemical, dump it, dump it, dump it until I could find a potable like, hey, I can taste it, but it's not as concentrated as the crap I just went through. And um, and so, yeah, and then, of course, the malaria pills, right, right, that they say now they know it caused brain damage or something or whatever, whatever. And so I'm just, like, thinking about all these things. And this is, this is after I've already got my degrees in chemical engineering and chemistry. So now I understand more about, like, um, chemicals leaching and chemistry in general, right? And I understand profoundly more about chemistry than I did back as a dumb grunt. And so when he, when he got this rare form of cancer, I'm like, man, I'm going to write something about that water. And so, um, because that water, those, the, the chemicals that leach from plastics mimic hormones. So literally we're feeding troops a cocktail of hormones overseas, all right? That this is their only source of water. And so, um, so yeah, I wrote this little op-ed, right? Try to get it published in the Seattle times or whatever. And, um, things happened with that. And I ended up writing to a woman who was writing for the military times. She was writing water quality articles about the bases in the States and how they were giving people cancer from the air, uh, the firefighting foam that they use on aircraft, the, the PFAS, I think it's called. Um, and so, um, so I reached out to her and I was like, Hey, look, I see you're writing these water quality articles. 
for bases in the States. I just wrote this article for what I experienced overseas. If you can put me in touch with somebody who can help me get this like in front of somebody who cares about water quality overseas, that would be great. And she, this was over the weekend. So she's emailing me back through her iPhone, you know, in the email you can see sent through iPhone. And she's like, oh, this is great. Can we run it in the military times? I was like, yeah, I'd be honored for y'all to run it in the military times. But I want to submit it to the Seattle Times first because I want a, a um, civilian audience to read it, right? Because of course, the military, we'd know all about our own problems. So I was like, you know, I'd love for the civilian audience to be able to read it. Can I try to run it in? Because the Seattle Times doesn't want an op-ed out everywhere before they run it. They kind of want to be that first people to release it. So I was like, hey, you know, they don't want it anywhere else. Give me, you know, a week. Let me see what they say. And if not, we can run it in the military times. So when the Seattle Times rejected it and I reached it back out to her, she started to ignore me. And I mean, I didn't kind of like rigorously pursue her. Like I sent her an email saying like, hey, I'm ready to run this in military times if you're ready. She never responded. And I don't think I ever like tried to follow up. But what I think happened personally, I don't know if this is true and it's probably, you know, me, my conspiracy theorist side of me. But I think because in my op ed that I wrote, I wrote like, hey, I saw a bunch of atrocities in my military service. And this is the first one I'm going to write about because it doesn't affect just the guys that I served with. It affects NATO troops because there's troops from all over the world who yeah. drink that water on that base. And so I was like, yeah, you know, I've seen all kinds of atrocities. This is the first one I want to point out because it doesn't just affect the guys I served with. It affects everybody. And so I think whenever, you know, she was happy to read it the weekend. And then I think when she went to work that week, she showed it to her higher ups or whoever she had to show it to. And they were like, oh, he's a part of this unit. Kill it. Don't talk to him anymore. We don't want him to have a platform because they killed my unit, right? We got back from Afghanistan. That same month, the unit got back from Afghanistan. They deactivated the unit. Yeah, 5-2. Yeah. So I think, you know, I really think that they were like, hey, this guy's from 5-2. The army killed that unit, you know, eight years ago. Keep it dead. And so it really motivated me to write the book. And so, because at that point, I had already been writing. Um, I started writing 10 years ago in Afghanistan. You know, I was seeing it. I didn't know I was deploying until the day I left. I didn't get my MRI results from my messed up shoulder until the day before we deployed. And so it was a big mess even before all that. And so, um, yeah, I started to write down a bunch while I was overseas. And I even took a voice recorder with me so I could record conversations with... That's how bad it was. Yeah, because I, everybody, NCOs, officers, chaplains, everybody was lying through their teeth. And I wanted to be able to protect myself. So I had the voice recorder recording for what I thought were going to be most... You know, it wasn't always on me on. But when I knew I was probably going to have an important conversation with somebody, I turned that thing on because I was tired of one NCO saying this and one officer saying that. And, you know, it's just like, it was the most toxic culture, I think, probably the military has ever experienced or one of, definitely. I know the Fort Hood stuff right now is really bad. But, um, but yeah, it, it was pretty toxic. Yeah, no, too was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty bad. And actually, I didn't know until I was doing research for my book that in 2010, Fort Lewis was considered the worst military base of all military installations in the world. And I think a big part of it had to do with 5-2 because just like the morale of that place was dead. Yeah, it was a higher up. So I know like the battalion commanders, we have the brigade commanders, like higher ups are going after each other, backstab, backstabbing each other. It's like it was bad. Yeah. I remember those articles in Army Times a couple years after that. That's trying to explain, you know, all the, all the kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I started the story 10 years ago in Afghanistan and I always wanted to write about the unit. And, um, and it wasn't until the military, or I'm sorry, until the Seattle Times invited me to tell my high school story. And I was like, man, that's just one high school story. I've got tons of crazy things that happened to be in grade school. And I kind of thought about it in two ways. I was like, one, if I just write about 5-2 and my experiences, it's going to seem just like a biased book about like, hey, here's this disgruntled soldier, had this experience in this unit. And they kind of, you know, he got kind of the short end of the stick. So this book, it's biased because he had a bad experience. And so I thought, okay, to avoid that, I want to write about my whole story. Right? I'm going to talk about my earliest childhood memories that I can remember of all the stuff that I experienced growing up and how I ended up in that military unit as one of the first privates. So I saw everything, right? When I got there, we had no buildings, we had no vehicles, we had no weapons. We had maybe 50 people in, or maybe, maybe 50 to 100 people in the uh, brigade, right? It was the, the entire brigade was on main post. And of course, as we got more people, they shoved us over to North Fort Lewis. 
And of course, we started to get buildings and weapons and vehicles and stuff. But I was literally one of the first people in that unit and one of the first people out of that unit. So I was like, man, you know, I have this real unique perspective to talk about, you know. Because 5-2 was the only unit you knew in the military then. Yep, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I, I really thought like, hey, if I tell my whole story and people see this, like, hey, how he grew up and how he raised himself and, um, yeah, and how he ended up in this unit, that it'll bring more validity to the things I say rather than, like I said, oh, this is my experience in this unit, blah, blah, blah. It sucked, whatever. And so, yeah, so that was my two ways to think about it. it was like, yeah, I have a bunch of crazy things that I can talk about that happened in my early childhood. And not only that, it'll bring more validity to the things I say rather than just a bitch fit book about a military unit. So are you going to try to like, go to a publishing house and get this published? Are going to do Amazon or? Well, yeah, I mean, more than likely, it's been kind of a long learning process with all that, you know, because I wrote the book. I started to write the book whenever I got um, ignored from that military times woman. And uh, I just started writing, you know, I just kind of wanted to vent. And it was really weird when I started writing, I could feel like my soul being sucked away from my body as I tried to remember like my earliest traumatic childhood memories. It was really kind of surreal. And, um, and so yeah, I just started writing and you know, a year plus later, actually, I, I stopped, I stopped writing and I kind of got that self doubt, like who's gonna want to read a book about me? And so I stopped and that's when I filed my patent and then my patent attorney, you know, I did a bunch of research on my patent attorney. And when I went through all that process, he sent me his book, right? Cause he's written a book as well. And at the end of the book, he talks about like, Hey, whenever I was writing this book, I'm a lawyer, right? I'm a, I mean, he's a pretty big time patent lawyer. And he's like, here I am patent lawyer writing this book. Whenever I gave it to my friends, they're like, what are you doing? Why are you writing a book? You're a lawyer, go lawyer, you know? And he's like, he just thought it was so weird because he was like, like, yeah, so what? I'm a lawyer, but I can do other things too, you know? And like, not only that, they're like, oh, you're a lawyer. Like, who's going to want to read a story about a lawyer? You know, no big deal. But he just talks about how, like, you have to tell your story no matter how unspecial you think your story is because you never know what's going to come from it. And an example he gives in his book is like, so this uh, lawyer, right? There, this law student wrote a book about his first year of law school and his experiences in his first year of law school not knowing what was going to come from it, right? Just like, hey, I'm just going to write a book about my experiences in this first year of law school. And so um, now, apparently, right, this is what he said in the book, is like now that book that this guy wrote kind of willy-nilly about his first year of law school is almost like mandatory reading at law schools across the country now for first-year law students. Like, hey, this is what you can expect in law school. So it's like, wow, that's kind of crazy, right? So like you just never know what's going to happen. Or who you're going to aspire by your book. Either, yeah, you? mm-hmm. And so, you know, going back to your question about how I'm going to publish, you know, I, I did do a bunch of like um, research into it and self-publishing seems to be the way to go these days because it even seems like publishers who have previously been traditionally published by a publishing house or company want to self-publish now because like a lot of the tools we have access to now, right? Before you had to rely on the publishing house to do marketing and have that high speed internet connection so they can put stuff on the internet or reach a certain audience or do whatever or put the ads out in a certain way. But now, you know, with the technology age, we have all these tools available to us. Oh, excuse me. And so it seems like um, that it seems like, you know, most people who have, who have even traditionally published want to do self publishing these days. And me personally, um, I'd like to self publish and, you know, Miss Bob, Renee Bob, through, you know, the veterans and residents, I had a great meeting with her this past Friday. And I'm really excited to work with her because man, she's awesome. And yeah, it she, seems like, great, yeah. yeah, she seems like she's gonna really, because like, like I said, I did a bunch of this research, and I've read a lot of the things that like, successful authors do. So I have an idea of what I need to do. And when I was talking with um, Renee, she was telling me the things that she does. And I was like, wow, I've read about this stuff online. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. Like you've implemented and are doing the things I've read about online. So it's really cool to know like, hey, she's so this is successful. Yeah. So it's really cool to see like, hey, now I have this mentor and this, this, you know, person who's willing to guide me through the process mm -hmm. of, of getting this thing out and actually selling it and marketing it because marketing a book is really hard. <laughs> Especially if you're a known person. Yeah. So and I mean, right? I, I feel like books are almost like coming out almost at the same rate as of, of apps, right? Because yeah. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of apps that are released to the app store every day. 
And then because of the powers of self-publishing and Amazon and all these tools that we have, indie authors all over the world are kind of taking that same route of like, hey, you know, I'm just going to write and put it on Amazon, you know? So it's like self-publishing is something a lot of people are doing now. And, um, and yeah, so I'd like to, honestly, I'd like to traditionally publish. You know, I'd love for somebody to offer me um, – Million dollar book deal, go to go on a book tour, go to Oprah, all yeah, the different yeah, well, shows, you know. I mean, well, I don't know about all that. Some entrepreneur I, shows. <laughs> I really, I really don't want to like. It's it's hard for me, like I said, because my ultimate goal in life is just to be the best scientist and engineer that I can be. Like, I don't want to be r- super famous or super rich. Like, yes, I want money in the bank because access to capital is so powerful. And it'll allow me, you know, like this is why I'm doing entrepreneurship stuff, right? Because I want to have streams of revenue to allow me to do what I want to do. And what I want to do is keep going to school to be the best scientist and engineer that I can and make as many biotech companies as I can to or biochemistry companies or whatever. And so it's really hard because I know like if I were to get on the Joe Rogan podcast, you know, obviously that changes people's lives, right? Yeah. And I don't know if I want that, you know, like I want to sell a bunch of books, but I don't want to have like yeah, Twitter blowing up and all kinds What's of like saying you can't have your kick either too. So you just like, you got to do it either all the way, all the other way, probably, you know? Yeah. And that's um, one thing I talked with Renee about when, in terms of marketing the book, you know, how I was telling her, you know, like I'm a super introvert. And when I started writing this thing, I was writing it without the intention of anybody reading it. And it was really cool because that's how you have to write a memoir. I just did a master class uh, with Scribe Media who put out David Goggins' book. And so like they're the masters of memoir. And I would actually say that they don't consider Goggins' book as a memoir. They consider it more of a self-help book because he does have those little self-help tips in it. So they're like a true memoir isn't going to have any kind of self-help in it. It's just going to tell your story and allow the reader to pull from it, however, whatever they're going to pull from it. Think about your story, there are at least one kid in like the eighth grade right now and it's like some maybe some southern town in Idaho, <laughs> you know, on a ranch in Idaho, Montana, or Texas is going through the same thing you're going through, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I did that master class, and they basically said, when you write a memoir, you have to write with a mindset of no one's ever going to read this. Because if you write with the mindset of like, I don't want to offend people, I don't want to get sued, yeah, I don't, you know. Yeah, you're not Yeah, you're not, it's not going to be what it should be. So when I started writing, that's how I was writing it. And I didn't even know like, hey, you know, this is just me putting stuff on paper. I don't, you know, maybe I'll give it to friends and family. Maybe we'll see. And then as I started writing more, it got to a point where I'm dumping hundreds of hours into this thing. So it's like, yeah, I'd like friends and family to definitely read this. And then I'm the kind of person to where if I do something, I don't want it to suck. You know, like if I do something, I want it to be done right. And for it to not suck, you know, to the best of my ability anyway, right? Of course, people might think it sucks. And other aspects or whatever, but you know, I'm not going to put up, put out something half-assed, right? If I'm not satisfied with it, I'm not going to put it out. And so when I got done writing, I was like, man, now I got this hundred thousand word journal essentially that I need to turn into a book. So I started to write these other, read these other books and uh, learning how to turn it into a book. But, but yeah, like I said, it was really, you know, a big part of that was removing a bunch of my own personal thoughts and feelings from the book. Like, cause like I said, you The memoir, when it's time for the public to read it, you want the public to, like, it's not a journal, it's a memoir, right? So yeah, you're going to have some thoughts and feelings in some sense, but you don't want like, I mean, there is literally, you know, maybe 10, you know, 5,000 word parts of things that I cut out where it was just me kind of venting, you know, like venting about how I felt or what I thought. And so a lot of that had to get cut out. Because it doesn't keep the pages turning, right? Because yeah. it's got to be a page turner. Yeah, like yeah. That. And so I learned a lot about that. And so, you know, I, I'm really doing this not for me. You know, none of the stuff that I do is for me is kind of crazy as, you know, that may sound. Um, and a lot of people might not believe that. But like I said, like where I'm at in my life now, growing up the way I grew up, I never thought I would be here. You know, like I never thought I could get in front of a crowd and talk to people. I never thought I'd be a sniper. I never thought I'd have degrees in chemical engineering. You know what I'm saying? Like, I never thought I'd be able to do, like, and one of my dreams changed. When I was in junior high, I wanted to be a genetic engineer. And like, that eventually died too. I was like, I'll never be able to be a genetic engineer. Like, how the hell do you become a genetic <laughs> engineer, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, when I became, you know, when I started the chemical engineering coursework, I was like, man, I don't know if I can do this. 
but I'm going to take that same mentality of that I had in the military, where if I work hard and bust my ass, I'm probably going to be successful, right? So I'm just going to, I'm going to take the coursework. I'm going to study hard. I'm going to work hard and hopefully it works out, you know? And, you know, it took a lot of tears and beating my head against the books and walls. And it really does change your brain. Like you can feel your brain growing and changing. It's really yeah, weird. You don't realize like, you know, the more information you get, you know, your brain is an empty vessel. The more you put in there, the more you can take on, right? It's yeah. like a sponge. Yeah. And, and I mean, you start to learn, learn. There's no, you know, limit to what you can learn. Yeah, definitely. And you start to look at the world in a different way. And so, you know, you go through all that coursework and you start to change your mindset. And like, you know, in essence, yeah, I'm not a genetic engineer, but chemical engineering, you know, is pretty close to it. You know, I took a class in biochemical engineering. So it, that's one step removed from a genetic engineer in, a, in essence, right? I mean, I know biochemical engineers really scale things and genetic engineers do things on more of a DNA level. But, but yeah, and so um, I accomplished these things I, I never thought I'd be able to. And so for me, like, it's not even about money. It's not about fame. It's not about um, anything. But like I said, accomplishing my goal of being the best scientist and engineer that I can be. And when I met my startup uh, co-founder for my biotech startup that I'm involved with, I, he, it was like another life-changing moment for me because it was really um, weird. But I don't know. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, yeah. Because I, I guess we can get into the biotech stuff. If... Yeah, let's go ahead and go to that. Well, first, let's go to your, your, the phone case. Okay. How, how do you say the phone case company? Uh, Fennec. Talk about that and, uh, and the Kickstarter you're going to do with that. Okay. Yeah, so the Fennec case, um, you know, I had the idea as a senior engineering student in Texas, you know, especially there in Kingsville, Texas, it's so hot, you know, we're right there close to the water. So the humidity is always super high. And, and so it's always ridiculously hot. And so my phone is always getting hot, I'd always have to take the case off it to help it cool down. Or I would put it in front of the vents and the AC of the car or put it in the freezer. Yeah, or put it in the freezer. And that was never really a good idea. Because I mean, I'd say one out of every five times, you know, my intention was like, always like, I'm going to put it in the freezer for 30 seconds or less, because that's all it needs, right? It doesn't need to be in there for much longer. It's going to remove the heat pretty fast in the freezer. But of course, student, kids, life, you know, where's 30 seconds, phone? yeah, oh, 30 crap, seconds go by and 10 minutes later, I'm like, where's my phone? Where's my phone? And so, you know, when I got into my, you know, deeper engineering curriculum, and I started to learn about heat transfer, I realized like, hey, this phone is creating the heat and this plastic case is retaining it because plastic is an insulator. Yeah. So this big plastic case yeah, it's supposed is, to be protecting is really not protecting it. Yeah, yeah. And so we're not protecting it in one, I mean, you know, it's protecting it from falling, but not protecting it from overheating. And, um, and so I was like, man, all we got to do is remove as much of this plastic insulating material as we can and replace it with a more thermally conductive material, which would be metal, right? Metals. And so I was like, okay, just remove a big chunk of the plastic and replace it with plastic of the same dimensions and add some fins to it so we can increase the surface area, essentially making a radiator for the phone. And, um, and boom, you know, right now you've got something that'll transfer the heat to the environment. And so I had this idea, you know, and I thought it was, you know, just kind of clever, you know, a clever little thing for me to do. And I started to look into the patents of it, you know, because as chemical engineers, um, we do a little bit of patent, you know, for our senior project, we have to go into patents of other processes that happen. And we have to simulate those processes in a computer simulator and try to get them to the purities we need to get them to. And so I knew how to look into patents, started looking into the patents for this phone case stuff, did start to see some things about it. And I was like, oh, okay, well, this, you know, idea has some merit if there's other. It's like no other like phone company was doing this, like Autobox or none of the other ones, anything like that. No. And um, I don't know if, I don't think I ran into that patent. I did run into some patents that looked like, um, I, I think this is what happened because this is a long time ago. This is like 2016, 2015 when this happened. And so I went home, I started to look at the patents online. And I found patents that were like exactly what I basically invented, right? And so what I thought anyways, and so I was like, man, it took the wind out of my sails. I was like, somebody beat me to it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so maybe a few months went by. I was like, you know what? Let me go back and look again. So I went back and I looked again. And I noticed that those patents that I was looking at before, they were Chinese patents. They were patents from China. 
if you go do a patent search through Google, Google's going to show you all the patents from all over the world. And so they were patents from China. And if you want patent protection, you have to do patents in every um, country you want protection in, unless you go through like, there is like a patent process where you can do like this one, I'm sure it's super expensive process and they will patent your product in multiple countries. But for the most part, you have to patent your idea in whatever country you want protection in. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, um, these patents are in China. I want to patent this for the US. So, you know, let me look into it some more. And it wasn't until, you know, I went over and studied at a friend's house and um, a chemistry, you know, one of my chemistry classmates, and he was, you know, went over to his house. He was looking frantically for his phone. He's like, where's my phone? And he's like, oh, yeah. And he pulled it out of the freezer. And I just couldn't believe it because I thought like I was the only person in the world who put their phone in the freezer. And I just couldn't believe it. It really blew my mind. I was like, wow, you do that too? <laughs> I was just blown away by it. And um, he was like, yeah, man, you know, it gets hot. I try to throw it in there for, you know, a couple of seconds and then I'll take it out. But a lot of times I forget. I was like, oh, yeah, I totally understand. I do that too. And that was kind of my validation, right, for my idea and maybe decide like, hey, you know, maybe I will patent this. So, of course, patents cost a lot of money. And so I started talking to um, family because I don't have many friends. <laughs> I started talking to family about maybe trying to help me patent this idea. And um, of course, you know, family is, isn't the strongest, right, in, in, my, in my life. So I really didn't have anybody to turn to other than my dad. And my dad was trying to do other things, right? So to ask my dad for thousands of dollars to help me go halves on this patent stuff was really kind of outside the realm of reality. And so I just had to put it on the back burner, you know, the, it sat there for years, uh, the idea anyway. And then, you know, it wasn't until I stopped writing that book, you know, like I told you, I was writing the book, I got that self doubt and I stopped writing. And then I was like, you know what, if I stop writing this book, I need something to work on, because I'm going to go back to that depression if I don't. So I started talking to my wife about it. And I was like, hey, look, let's file this patent for this idea I had. You know, worst case scenario, it gets me a good job. Because when I went through that five months of applying for work, some of the applications I was doing were asking the applicant if they had a patent. And of course, I'd be like, no, next question. So I thought, okay, well, maybe it'll be an easy way on easy, right? Not cheap, but an easy way for me to prove to the world that not only do I understand engineering concepts, I know how to apply them to the real world, right? Because I found this real world problem use my engineering knowledge and solved it. So I thought, okay, worst case scenario gets me a good job. Best case scenario, I get rich from it, right? So it seemed like it was a win-win. You know, that's basically how I talked to my wife about it. He's like, hey, you know, hopefully it gets me a good job. Maybe I can get into a good program or something with the help of it on my resume. Best case scenario, we get rich off it. So she was thankfully, you know, got behind me and we went forward with the patent. And then, like I said, I stopped my book. I had no interest in writing my book anymore after that. And then it wasn't until um, my patent attorney sent me his book and I read his book and I was like, yep, wow. Motivated. And it was actually before I actually paid him money to do the patent stuff because um, he sent me the book and I was like, he really motivated me to get back to my book. And I was like, well, even if I don't file the patent, at least he motivated me to get back to my book, right? So, but yeah, so I ended up filing the patent with him, um, John Rizvi out of Florida. And I went with him because he's one of the best patent attorneys in the country, right? He's like the patent attorney for the billionaires and millionaires. Um, he's actually the patent attorney for um, uh, the guy he just got shown, I think, in one of our Monday meetings, the, the infomercial guy, the billionaire infomercial guy. Didn't he get shown at one of our? Yeah, I think I knew you talked about. Yeah, that. yeah. So he's actually the patent attorney to him. And so... Um, you know, I did call around the country for patent attorneys and yeah, I could have got the patent done cheaper, but I knew it was going to be a fine line that we were going to have to walk based on the patents that were out there and based on what we were trying to do. So I went to him, told him, you know, showed him my stuff and he was like, Hey, this is a cool idea, but you need to pay me to do a patent search, you know? And I was like, cause I had done my own patent search and I thought, oh, okay, let me just send him what I found and he'll just take a quick look at it. And uh, let me know, like, hey, yeah, we can go for it or not. And he's like, no, that's not how this works. It's like, for me to look at a patent is $400 per patent for me to look at. I was like, oh, man. He's like, or you can pay me $1,500 and I will look for, you know, I will look through all the patents, see what I can find on top of the things you provide me. And that way, you know, rather than looking at four or five patents, you pay me $1,500 and we'll look at a bunch of them. 
And I was like, okay, cool, you know, we'll go for it. And it was kind of a big risk at the time, right? Because $1,500 is a lot of money. And at that point, I think I might have even spent some more, maybe a little bit more prior to that. But he was, um, you know, basically, you know, he could have came back and said, yeah, man, I found this prior art. I don't think it's a good idea. You shouldn't go forward with it. And I would have been like, okay, you're the patent attorney. I'm going to listen to you, obviously. So thanks a lot for your time and have fun with my $1,500, you know. But thankfully, now he came back and he was like, I think we're going to be good to go. So we should move forward with it. And um, so, yeah, I was really thankful. And the biggest worry for me was LG, you know, the major company LG, they have like TVs and they do everything LG. There was a patent that I think I had found that was from 2001, I think it was, which is weird to me because that's even before smartphones were even a thing, right? 2001. And so this patent from 2001 that LG filed was basically my idea. It's the idea of having a phone case that, that dissipates heat, but it was just so broad. It was like, it's going to be a case that can remove heat via convection, conduction, this, that, you know, like they basically, it was a very broad general patent that was like 25 or 30 pages long. And so that one kind of made me a little bit of worry, a little bit worried, but the patent attorney didn't, wasn't worried about it. So we went forward with it. So now hopefully, um, you know, we, we went through the provisional patents, you know, the year of the provisional patent filed the non-provisional patent. So now it's just up to the USPTO over the next, you know, year or two to look at it and determine whether or not it's novel or not. And you have to wait for the patent to come back so you can start your, do your Kickstarter? No. Um, I mean, there's lots of companies, you know, you see a lot of patent pending products out there. So, you know, it's a, a kind of a weird thing for me. Like, yeah, I could sell this stuff and the patent could come back, you know, because the... I think I've read statistics out there that say like 60% of patents get rejected from the patent office their first time, right? So it's going to get rejected more than likely. My patent attorney is going to have to appeal or argue like their points or because they're going to say like, no, you can't patent this for this, this, and this reason. So my patent attorney is going to have to argue back saying, well, that's not right. That's not right. And that's not right or whatever. And so after that, you know, because that's going to add probably it's like, you know, a VA claim, right? When you want to appeal, it's going to add a year plus, you know? So after he appeals that part of it, I think they give you one or two times to appeal, right? So the, the patent office will say, no, you can't patent it. You can appeal. They'll, you know, say one more thing. And then I think maybe one more time you can give it one more shot and appeal one more time. So, yeah, so there's still a chance that this thing, you know, that the patent doesn't go through. And at this point, I've spent, you know, Ten thousand plus dollars <laughs> in money and hours, mm -hmm. but but I've already got my money's worth, right? Because I feel like it's a big reason that I got into that entrepreneurship program at UW, and because I got my Voc Rehab benefits, that was a twenty six thousand dollar program that got paid for through Voc Rehab, and not only that, you know, I got my monthly stipend, I got my my equipment from Voc Rehab, so you know, I I came out net positive with just getting into the UW. A program. So what's your plan to mass produce the phone case? How are you going to do that? I think you're going to manufacture <laughs> it. Have you, have you thought got that, that, got that far yet? Um, not so much. You know, when I filed the patent, I never in, it, intended to be the guy to make and sell the cases because I had the idea. But like I said, this isn't my passion, right? Selling phone cases and making like doing phone case stuff isn't my passion. So I th my m mentality was I'll file this patent and hopefully find an investor who maybe will want to make themselves super extra rich and will just throw me a bone, right? Because I don't even care about getting filthy rich off this thing. I just want a source of revenue so I can go get my PhD without having to worry about keeping the light on. And so I'd be happy to find an investor who takes the majority of the work and the majority of the profit and just allows me, you know, if I can make passively 50000 to to $100,000 a year off this thing and not have to mess with it, man, that would be a dream come true. And so that was my mentality, man. I don't want to mess. I don't want to make it so the cases because I really don't want to spend my time doing that. I'd rather spend my time studying biochemistry and working towards the things I want to do in my life. But I learned in this entrepreneurship program that- You never, never know what's going to kick off. You never know what's going to be the next big thing. Yeah. And I mean, I learned that a lot of times investors, you know, first off, investors in general are only going to invest in maybe two to four things in a year. And so you got to be lucky enough to- get an investor anyway. But not only that, you have to hit proof points, right? I mean, an investor is not going to invest in somebody that just says, hey, look at me, I'm educated and I got a patent. Oh, so are a hundred thousand million other people out there, you know? 
And so I didn't realize until late into the program that I need to stop being a baby. I need to make and sew these cases. And even for a little bit, I got to give a shout out to uh, my classmate, Yako, who um, he invited me over on a weekend to do some stuff on this platform called PitchBook. Yeah, I know, I know PitchBook. Yeah. And I, you know, they had talked about PitchBook before, but I never really spent a lot, any time on it. And when I went that weekend and we were looking at stuff for his venture startup, I mean, we were seeing all kinds of like metrics and how much VCs gave in the month and all that stuff. And, you know, I, um, we started to look up other smartphone case startup companies and whatnot. And there was um, LifeProof. LifeProof was a smart, is, is a smartphone case company that started in whatever year they started. We'll say t- 2012. They started in 2012, kicked butt for four years, and four years later, Otterbox them. Otterbox bought them for an undisclosed amount of money, probably a hundred million plus dollars. So when I saw that, and I mean, there was all kinds of M&A, all kinds of mergers and acquisitions in the smartphone case world. There was actually a smartphone case startup company that was bought out by Samsonite, the luggage company, for $80 million. And so... Not a bad chunk of change. Yeah, and so Yako was like, look at all this M&A going on in this. In the, and then it almost basically seemed like... like a phone case, like 10 20 maybe $30. You don't, it's, it's not a big deal. Yeah, know? yeah. And so... He's really the one who started to get me back on the horse. I was like, wow, like, so basically all I got to do is make and sell phone cases for three to six years and maybe I can walk away with, you know, 50 plus million dollars. Like a phone case that actually cools your phone down. Yeah, yeah. And so it it changed my perspective, right? Like, damn, maybe now I will make and sell these because like I'm willing to sacrifice my dream for another handful of years, right? If I can sacrifice my dream of being a super scientist for five more years so I can create this revenue source to where I'll never have to worry about money ever again in my whole life. Like it's worth the sacrifice to me because, uh, yeah. Cause like, you know, obviously my education and that stuff is important, but you know, I have enough education now and enough connection. No, not enough. I never have enough connections, but you know, the connections that I have made, um, are to really amazing people. And I'm really fortunate to be involved with this biotech startup because I mean, I, I still pinch myself over it. Like, cause I help kind of. So your biotech startup is called Omics Analytics. Uh, Omics. Omics. Omics Analytics. Analytics. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like, let's switch to that. Yeah, it's like genomics, proteomics, you know, so it's just like the omics is um, kind of just how it's pronounced. And, and it's spelled O-M-X. Yeah, it's spelled O-M-X. So it's omics, um, just kind of like a play on the word, right? O-M- O-M-I-C-S, but. But yeah, I'm really lucky. Um, and this is like your true like passion, right? Yeah, because I I founded it with the guy I met um, at my undergrad that I was telling you about earlier, and um, so it was my I think it was my last semester before I graduated with my undergraduate degrees. My professor, I was taking biochemistry. And, and the professor that taught that class, they call her the snake lady, right? She's like, she, she's a pretty famous snake researcher in terms of like snake venom or just animal venom, scorpion venom, spider venom. And so she had flown down to, I think, South America for some kind of snake conference or venom conference or something. And so her former student, my, my startup co-founder now, he flew down. He was a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard at the time. He was a working at Massachusetts General Hospital doing research for Harvard. And so he flew down to cover for her class while she was gone. And it, like I said earlier, it was the only way I can describe it, uh, it um, how I felt was I know you from somewhere, that I know you from somewhere feeling. But that's the only way I can describe it because it was that times a 100,000. You know, it was like the weirdest feeling I've ever had in my life. And... <laughs> It was like, it was so profound. It was, and it was like crazy because I walked up the steps to the second floor of where the biochemistry class was and he was in the hallway. And the second my eyes landed on him, it was like this profound feeling came over me. And I was like, what the hell? Like, this is so weird. And it's like, where do I know this guy from? And so I didn't even know he was teaching the class, right? I just, some dude in the hallway. And then I walk into the classroom and I sit down and he walks in. And he's like, hey, I'm going to teach the class because y'all's professor is gone. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know she was going to be gone. She didn't say anything about it first off. And I was like, wow, I didn't expect this, you know, it's kind of substitute professor. So he's there teaching us about, um, 
I think it's, he was teaching us about, I can't remember what it was exactly. I want to say it was like PCR. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's basically like how they do, I want to say it's uh, how they do like DNA testing or like how they, like they can take the DNA segment from a crime scene and they can make it a thousand fold multiply. And so I think that's what he was teaching us about, but I couldn't even focus, right? I was just in the class rerunning my whole life through my mind over and over. Like, how do I know this? Like, why do I feel this way? It's so weird. And so that whole class, you know, couldn't pay attention, couldn't think of where I know this guy from. And at the end of class, he was like, hey, guys, I'm going to do a talk later um, talking about how I grew up in this area, you know, poor Mexican family, single mom, um, you know, hardship through his life too, and how he ended up at Harvard. And so he's like, I'm going to give you all, like, I'm going to give a talk later. So I'd appreciate it if y'all came and listened to my talk. So I was like, oh, man, like, this is going to be cool. I'm going to listen to his talk. And then after his talk, I'm going to go up and I'm going to ask him for his email. And then later on, you know, later in the week, I'll email him telling him, hey, like, do I know you from somewhere? I had this really weird feeling. And so he, later that evening, he gave his talk. And after the talk, I approached him. And as I approached him, before I could even say anything, he goes, hey, man, do you have an older brother? I feel like I know you from somewhere. And I, I probably like fangirled at that point. Like my mind went blank. You know, I was just like, uh, you know, just like it was so weird because like, I've had that feeling a couple of times before, but I have never had anybody reciprocate it, right? So it was just like kind of this like out of body, out of world experience. And so whenever he told me that, I was like, no, man, I don't have an older brother. I have an older sister who's eight years older, but, you know, we lived in separate areas, a couple hours apart, or like me and this guy, not me and my sister. And so it's like, he's, he's basically almost a decade older than me. So like, we wouldn't even have the same friends more than likely. So I was like, no, nah, we don't know each other, man. We just both had this really weird feeling. And so from there on, um, I messaged him once a year, right? Because I mean, I was really intimidated, right? I didn't want to send him this email. I didn't want to email him once a month and be like, hey, you know, how are you doing? You know, here I am over here in Washington, depressed and, you know, wishing I could be learning, you know, from you. And that was and a big part of why I say he changed my life was because, or affected my life was because I knew I wanted to get my PhD, but I didn't know in what until I met him, right? Because I like, I'm interested in all kinds of science and I love organic chemistry and I do plan on getting a PhD in organic chemistry way down the road. But I wasn't sure like, man, I love thermodynamics. It's really hard, but interesting. I love organic chemistry because I love mechanisms um, I love a bunch of the different engineering um, um, disciplines, you know, like fluid transfer, heat transfer, especially heat transfer. Heat transfer is really cool to me. And I feel like I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> and, um, and so I had all these different things. I'm like, man, I don't know. I, I love all this science. What do I go to? Because when you get your PhD, I, obviously you have to specialize in something. And so when I met him, I was like, wow, I don't know what he studies, but I want to know what he knows because I have a feeling like this, this this underlying feeling that we both had, it, it isn't just by happenstance, right? I really think that there's something there. And I want to know as much biochemistry as I can. So that way I can communicate with him as a scientist and not just as a co-founder of a biotech startup. Because, you know, I do like, you know, even before I started this entrepreneurship, co you know, um, business stuff, I just knew like at the end of his talk, he said, I'm at Harvard right now and I've been at Harvard for a couple of years and I'm not going to leave Harvard unless somebody gives me my own lab. He said, I feel like I've done enough in my academic career now to where I deserve my own lab. So I'm not going to leave Harvard unless somebody gives me my own lab. And when he said that, I thought to myself, I'm going to give him his own lab. You know, like, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to figure out a way to do it. So when I, you know, wrote the book, it was partially, you know, to tell the story about what I experienced, but more so to start to shine a positive light on 5.2 because all the everything out there on 5.2 is negative. And it only it's only because of the handful of, you know, bad actors and incompetent leaders that we had. When really, the, like, I mean, just doing research for my book and talking to people I hadn't talked to in 10 years uh, and the things they were telling me about uh, the things they did overseas. I mean, it brought me to tears and I'm just like, wow, like, this is so wrong. Like, we need y'all to be recognized for this, you know? So my intention is to sell my book and to create enough revenue to start a documentary to do on the unit in a positive light or on the battalion. And um, 
And uh, when I filed the patent for my smartphone case, it was with the thought of hey, like, hey, I'd like to bring at least enough revenue to provide me to go to P- get a PhD without worrying about bills. But best case scenario, it'd bring me enough revenue to give this guy a biotech company. So yeah, I mean, it, like I said, the things that I do, obviously, I'm going to be a beneficiary of, but they're not for me. Everything that I'm doing is for other people because if I can give this guy a biotech company or his own lab, I know that he's going to be able to create something great because he's worked with Nobel Prize winners and he's done great things in his academic career. And that was one thing he said about, you know, um, in his talk was like, hey, I was doing research here and I decided on my own to look at these certain proteins. And my supervisor caught me and he was like, hey, why did you purify these proteins or why did you do this? And he was like, well, I found them interesting. And he's like, well, well, don't do that, right? Because that's not your job. You know, your job is to purify these or to do this. So he was just like, he was just kind of gets aggravated at things like that. Like, hey, I'm a, I'm a scientist. Let me do science, you know? And so, so yeah, my goal is just to, to help as many people as I can. And of course, I, I so benefit what is along the, the way. what's going to actually do? What's that? What's the company going to do? So right now, he, he left Harvard in 2018, went back down to our um, university. We graduated from our alumni, Texas A&M University, Kingsville. And there in Kingsville, they have what they call the National Natural Toxin Research Center. And it's the only federally funded Viper research center in the country. Viper owners and snakes. Yeah. So Not Dodge Vipers. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so I didn't know this until recently. They house over 340 snakes there. I was like, wow, I didn't. That's, I mean, I thought maybe they housed right 50 to 100, but over 300 snakes. I was like, wow, where do they keep them all? You know, but, um, but yeah, so they have decades of data of, of lethality tests that they've done on mice, right? Because you've got to get LD, and like not even just for the venom, but also for, because um, that center does work for pharmaceutical companies. So like if you're a, a biotech startup trying to create a new medicine, you can contract the center to do the LD50 and the ED50 testing to see like, hey, it's lethal dose, it's this, it's effective dose, is this. And so they have decades of data on lethality tests, if effective, uh, I'm sorry, um, drawing a blank here, um, the effectiveness tests, the efficacy tests, I'm sorry. And so, um, so they have all this data. So what we're trying to do is create a platform where you can put in, like, let's say um, there's a handful of snakes. I mean, like, I'm by no means an expert in any of this stuff. I've done a lot of research over the last two or three months about it because I've been in the talks with them about trying to start up a company, uh, a, bio, a biochemistry company of some sort. And at first we were talking about um, creating a anti-venom um, that is temperature stable because the anti-venoms that exist now have to be kept cool. And so he's like, yeah, man, like, I know I can create um, an anti-venom that is temperature stable. We just need llamas and a little bit of land and a little bit of money. He's like, it's super cheap. It's super easy to do. And, or I can't say it's easy to do, but he's like, it's relatively cheap to do. So we just need time and a little bit of money and some llamas and we can create an anti-venom. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Okay, cool. You know, like you're the scientist, you tell me about this stuff. Right. And so, um, yeah, so it kind of, you know, like pivot, right? We pivot, we talk, and we're trying to figure out what's the best thing, what's the best market, what can we do that's going to be good for the future. And so he knew um, through his awesome academic career that he took, he met a guy in Canada at that uh, Cancer Research Research Institute he was working at in Canada. And this guy does um, AI. He does, he's like AI data scientist, uh, computer modeling kind of stuff. So we're creating a platform. We're going to create, take all this data from the research center. And of course, we'll have to do our own experiments to fill in some of the gaps in the data. And um, we're going to create a platform where, where people, we're not sure if we're going to have it to like a service where people can hop on and use online, or if they're going to have to like send us their compound um, profile. So that way we can run it in our system and then give them the results. But regardless, it's going to be... Um, an AI platform that helps to identify therapeutic targets or therapeutic proteins in the venom, right? Because a venom is a big venom is a big mix of proteins of all kinds of proteins. And there's a lot of medicine that has been sourced from venom. And so, you know, obviously, it takes science, 
and scientists a lot of time, money, research to historically to go through these venoms, identify potential drug candidates in this big mix and, of. And some guess like each venom is different. Like rattlesnake venom is different from copper venom, yeah. different from viper venom. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this AI computer system will be able to punch in like data points and it'll be able to spit out like, hey, maybe you should look at these proteins. Maybe you should look at creating enzymes that block these targets to inhibit, you know, to help, you know, create a better anti-venom or, you know, things like that. You know, they call it in silico services. So you can think about, you know, how there's basically AI driven everything th these days, right? So it's kind of taking that same sense of drug candidates, right? Because there's always a ton of drug candidates that are potential, like, it's kind of like the coronavirus vaccine now, right? So there's tons of potential coronavirus vaccine candidates, but they know that only one, if we're lucky, two of them is actually going to pan out. So to minimize a lot of that stuff, actually, uh, one of our, the guys on our team, uh, Tariq, he's the data scientist. He created a platform originally to um, help determine like which cells may turn cancerous first. <clears throat> and he revamped the platform to like identify cancerous things or how to identify therapeutics for cancers to identify therapeutics for coronavirus. So because of his platform, he's basically created an artificial being where you can run lethality tests on and get like data back on that stuff. So we're trying to minimize animal testing, right? Because if we can get a computer to spit out data instead of testing on mice, will save money and time. Because he says that, uh, my co-founder Jacob says that to do a lethality test, it takes 30 or 36 mice and two days, right? Because you've got to inject the mice and you've got to wait and see what happens with the mice. And so if you don't hit that LD, and, it, and he says usually they can get the LD50, the lethal dose within two tries, right? The first try, they may not hit it, but the second try, but that's like almost, you're almost getting to a week now, right? You're approaching a week to find out something the computer will be able to tell you in an hour, you know? So how long does it take them to build this up? Um, it all, it's tough right now um, because we're applying for an STTR grant and SBIR grants. We just incorporated um, about two weeks ago. We're still waiting for the, the okay paperwork from Texas State. But our, our technology guy, Tariq, the CTO, he, um, he is currently doing postdoctoral work at Harvard as well. And so he's really busy at Harvard. So you have some pretty smart people in your team. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying like, it's really kind of crazy to me how I'm the one who's actually helped do a lot of, put a lot of this together. And of course, it, and, you know, it's mostly through Jacob, right? Because Jacob is the one who's the super academic and gone through all these amazing research institutes and created this awesome network. But yeah, I mean, it, we're really fortunate to um, have two sides of it, right? Because I have the business side of it and the understanding of it a lot better than I did a year ago prior to getting into the UW program. And he has all the science networks and all the science know-how because of all his networks. So I'm really hoping, uh, you know, our ultimate goal is to transition South Texas into a biotech hub. Because right now, the only industries, that, I mean, the majority of, of people employed in, we'll say anything south of San Antonio, it's probably, I mean, I'm just making these numbers up, so don't get too mad at me, internet. But um, I would say, you know, uh, I would estimate 60 to 80% of the people in that area depend on either the oil field or, or ranch work of some sort. And so when the oil field goes away, like it did, you know, a month or two ago, whenever, yeah, I mean, like, everybody's hurting, you know? And so, especially in my small town, you know, my small town alone, this I can be, you know, speak more openly about and know more for sure. I mean, that town is probably 80 to 90% dependent on the oil field, if not more than 90%. And so when something like that happens, I mean, it really hurts the town. And so, you know, I, I remember the, when the oil prices dropped in like 2014 or 2015 and gas in Texas got down to like a $1.20 or a $1.50. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, this is crazy. I haven't seen gas prices like this in forever. But yeah, um, a lot of people were hurting, my dad included, because my dad works in the, in the oil field. And so we really want 
to start to transition that area away. Like diversify the industries and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, because it's like any smart investor, right? You're going to diversify that portfolio. So whenever one sector of the economy takes a hit, you don't lose all your money, right? So it's kind of that same sense where South Texas really needs to bring a major industry. And I know they're doing it around Austin and I'm probably around Houston, but the South has been historically ignored. And we're trying to change that because there's like my co-founder is like, it's so passionate about this. He's like, there's so much talent here in South Texas that has to move away because there's no opportunity there. So our goal is over, obviously it's going to take a long time, but our goal in our lifetime is to create a biotech hub in South Texas because they need a, a newer, better industry that's going to take them into the future so and not hold them in the like past. Your, your target demographic for the company, like who's going to, who are you looking to purchase your products? Well, mostly it's going to be um, for the biotech, it's going to be research institutions and um, uh, other biotech startups like pharmaceutical startups and other biotech startups who are trying to minimize the cost they do on testing, the lethality testing or testing their compounds. And a big part about it, excuse me, it's, um, it's hard to really put down on numbers how much we save people because a lot of the cost incorporated with drug development comes with running drugs down the pipeline, only to find out at the end of the pipeline, this isn't going to pan out. So when we save companies money, we save them, like, let's say a company comes to us with 20 drug candidates. And they say like, hey, we have all these drug candidates we want to run in our pipeline. Historically, they'd have to run them all and figure out which ones are going to pan out. But now with these in silico services, not just ours, there's tons of services out there like this. Ours is only specific to Venom, right? Because we have the Venom data. But like there's other um, services out there that offer this based on like just uh, over-the-counter drugs or like sim more simple um, drug compounds because drug compounds are very simple molecules, you know, maybe have 50, you know, on the high end, 100 to maybe 1,000 atoms in a drug. But protein has hundreds of thousands of atoms, if not millions and millions of atoms because it's a – instead of just little – molecules they're big protein compounds that are made up of a bunch of little cells and you know stuff like that so so our service is going to be unique in terms of venom but there are other services out there and like you said in terms of like the target market it's going to be um, academic institutions who are trying to always trying to minimize the cost of the research they do and their budgets right because there's always budget constraints within university um, um, departments and stuff like that so it's not really I mean you if I mean, it's even like now, you know, that that research center, the the NNTRC, the, the Natural Toxin Research Center, um, they mostly work with like established biotech companies. I think um, they work with bio uh, pharmaceutical companies in Mexico. They do a bunch of like stuff already. But if you're just like a regular person and you want to have, you know, whatever compound test, like just say you're a, a garage chemist and you created this compound, you want to know, hey, how lethal is this compound I created? You can pay them, I think, $3,600 or something like that, and they will test the compound for you. So I'm sure it'll be the same way with us, you know, like, hey, it's going to be mostly uh, applying to these startups and these, inst these academic institutions. But if you want to put down, you know, a couple of thousand and test, you know, virtually test whatever compound you want to test, we can test it for you. So you, you, you're doing more than a, an, a, a, like a analytics a biochemical company. You, you're trying to be economic empowerment to the whole region of the United States. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, ultimately the goal, like I said, because um, we want to spend more companies out of this, right? Because we're going to have this platform that tells us, hey, you should look at this protein or maybe this therapeutic target. Um, so then we're going to have to experiment and, and actually figure out like, hey, is this, you know, something that we should follow up on? So my co-founder, he's already getting ideas of like, hey, we can spin out a vaccine company out of this or like an anti-venom company out of this um, because, and I, and I know that's something he still wants to do. Um, and it's funny because we got on PitchBook and on PitchBook, there's actually, I, I sent it to him. I was like, hey, look at this. How ironic, huh? It's a PitchBook profile on a company that's an, an anti-venom company that creates an anti-venom that's temperature stable and has no side effects. And, and my co-founder was like, wow, that's quite the claim to make. <laughs> I like to say no side effects is quite the claim to make. And my buddy that I talk to every day from the, the military, he's like, yeah, you don't want to ever claim that because I could just say I have a headache and, you know, boom, I can sue you, you know? And so, uh, so yeah, so I know my co-founder ultimately is going to want to create another uh, company that's going to create 
potentially the therapeutics uh, that our platform spits out. So yeah, yeah, our, our goal is to just, like I said, and I mean, he has all kinds of ideas because he's the super scientist, of course. So he's been talking to me about like, hey, this um, Texas A&M and the uh, Rio Grande Valley, right? Basically the border of Texas and Mexico down there, they just built this new hospital. And this hospital has, I can't remember if he said like, is the biggest reservoir of plasma or blood or something like that. And he is like, yeah, you know, they're doing all this stuff and like, that's going to help us push this transition because the universities are trying to push too. And so like, like here at UW, one thing I love about UW is they, they have departments that are multidiscipline departments that bring in, you know, um, you know, you need your computer scientists from the computer science department to help create this platform that the like, kind of like what we're doing now, right? So UW does such a phenomenal job at bringing in multidiscipline teams to make incredible things happen. And then they just end up making departments. I like the genome science department at UW is just was created by bringing in all the experts from the different sciences to try to figure out the human genome, right? And so, yeah, and then of course they take it from there and they do other great science there. But that's what we want to do for uh, Texas A&M University Kingsville. We're hoping, you know, down there in the South to get multidisciplinary teams together to, you know, because UW spins out companies left and right. So, and a bunch of universities. Like, be like a bio, bio startup hub for yeah. South Texas or the nation. Yes, sir. And so like a lot of companies all over the uh, country and probably all over the world do that, right? They have their... I think he said Purdue, um, where he got his PhD from, has like their Purdue Research Park or something like that, right? Where it's just maybe 200 acres or something of all these research institutes, right? And that's their research park where you want to go and get like the most cutting edge research or whatever. So, yeah, you know, those are things that we're hoping to do to transition South and, Texas. And this ties you into we want to get a PhD in a, in a chemistry from biochemistry right yeah um yeah like i said biochemistry because i didn't know what i wanted to study before i met him and whenever i met him i was like wow i want to be able to communicate as a scientist not just as a civilian right it's just a person so i want to um and then you know my ultimate dream is to you know my thought was like man get this guy a lab and then i don't even need to go get a phd i can just be under his wing inside of that lab you know i could just be a hook up an umbilical cord to him and follow him around everywhere in that lab and um but no you know it is something that i should do i feel upon my own you know because i could know everything in the world about biochemistry but without that phd no one will take me serious you know or maybe they will after i with my co-founder created this great thing 50 years down the line and then maybe then people would listen to me like no oh, i know about biochemistry so like yeah, I said, he only has a bachelor of biochemistry, company, but he's a founder of this great biochemistry company. Yeah, and you know, like I said, and that was my mentality before getting into this UW program. And UW changed my life. There's no doubt about it. Because first off, I never understood the power of a network, right? Of of networking. That was powerful. And so, you know, I never understood that. And that's why I was like, yeah, just me and the scientists, we can just hang out in our, you know, in our little startup laboratory and I'll learn everything I can from him. But by going and getting my PhD at, U, uh, PhD at UW, I mean, they're world renowned programs. They're hard to get into, right? You have, you know, like to get in, accepted into one of their PhD programs for biochemistry, whether that's through genome science, the um, molecular and cellular biology department, or just their biochemistry department or any of their departments that deal with biochemistry they're all world-renowned departments and they're all very competitive positions to get and so i just want to know because like obviously you do coursework and you're going to get a broad range of things on top of like your specialist what you're being disciplined you know or what you're learning and uh, i just want like i said i want to be a super scientist i don't want to just be good at proteins or good at biochemistry because or just be good at venom, or just be good at X, Y, Z, right? Because my co-founder, he got his, I think his bachelor's in biology, his master's in chemistry, and his PhD in biochemistry. And he went from Purdue, where he did research. Um, I'm not sure what kind of research he did there. I think he did start doing cancer research there. 
but he went from like doing venom research as an undergraduate to cancer research in Canada and to Harvard and then back to venom research. And so I just want to be able to be like that, right? I want to be able to be a scientist where like, hey, I'm not just an expert like in a just this man one of thing. Yeah, yeah. Just and that's why I want to also um study uh, get my PhD in organic chemistry. Cause I really wanted organic chemistry before I met this guy. So that's it's my passion. I love organic chemistry. And I feel that basically the lowest levels of matter are like the quantum realm, right? You have your quantum realm, you have your quarks and your whatever, whatever is right. I don't know too much about quantum mechanics, but, and I don't think too many other people do either, but, <laughs> and so um, just real quick, um, quantum mechanics is the lowest level of stuff that we know of. And then organic chemistry is kind of like that next level up because organic chemistry, you're messing with things that are just atoms. You're messing with atoms in a molecule. And biochemistry is that next layer up where you're not just messing with atoms in a molecule, you're messing with proteins or cells in a bigger body. You know, you're thinking about things or processes um, like um, they call it, oh, what do they call it? Like when you cut yourself, when you get a cut and the whole, it's called um, like, a, can't, if like it's not a da uh, daisy chain, but like a, a chain reaction, right? It's essentially a mechanism or a chain reaction that takes place. You get a cut, you start to bleed, your body sends these signals, these proteins start to come to the area so they can clot the, the wound. So I like, it's this bigger aspect of these proteins doing these things in your body when organic chemistry is the smaller level where it's just atoms inside of a molecule. So I feel like if I get my PhD in organic chemistry and biochemistry, I will be such a powerful resource in terms of just knowing about living things because like organic chemists mostly are a lot, it encompasses a lot of things, but they're the ones who are mostly responsible for creating medicines, right? They're the ones who create medicine and medicinal compounds. Biochemists do it that same thing in a sense, but they work with, you know, proteins. They work on cancer. They're looking at bigger things, not just these small, tiny atoms. And so, my ultimate goal, because I made my dream happen as a sniper, is to become an astronaut. Still, I haven't given up on my astronaut dream. So, whenever I'm filthy rich from entrepreneurship, I'm going to learn Russian. I'm going to learn how to fly planes and hopefully fast mover jets. I don't know if you can do that as a civilian fly fast movers. I'm sure you can if you have enough money, but, but yeah, I need the flight experience. I need the language experience. And I feel like if I get biochemistry and bio, or I'm sorry, biochemistry and organic chemistry, that I'd be a really strong candidate to send to space. So what's your take on this? It might be off the I mean, they might not want to send me because PTSD, but we, we can work through that. Yes, definitely have <laughs> enough money. <laughs> definitely. So what's your take on this? It might be off the subject about, about genetic engineering. Like there's a lot of scientists that do like genetic engineering, like cure diseases and stuff like that. I kind of think it's like slippery slope, right? Like, where do you stop? Like, where do you stop? Like, do you like make a superhuman race of humans? Like, do you do genetic? Like, how do you, what do you, how do you think about that? It's a definitely a double-edged sword because without it, we won't be able to feed our growing population. So, you know, we genetically modify crops to be able to withstand harsher conditions as the climate changes. And we genetically modify them to resist pests that we would normally otherwise have to spray tons of chemicals on. And so, you know, it's, like I said, it's a double-edged sword because it's definitely, it's an, an, it's an inevitability. It's going to happen and it's going to get used more and more. And as with any science, it'll get better as, as the generations go by. But, you know, of course there are concerns with, you know, especially newer, newer things. So especially like whenever, um, Scientists are reckless about it. Like that. Do, do scientists have like some kind of code of ethics they have to follow? They're supposed to follow like, like doctors. I mean, do? they're they don't have to, right? I mean, nobody has to do anything really. But I mean, unless you're like you don't care about your job or things like that. But yeah, I mean, of course you're supposed to want your science to be peer reviewed, right? You want to get feedback from other scientists before you decide to do an experiment that's going to affect an animal or a person's life. And it's like that Chinese, um, I don't know if you've heard about this, but that Chinese scientist who used CRISPR to genetically engineer uh, two little girls while they were in their embryo. 
and he genetically modified them so to where they could never get AIDS, right? He removed whatever receptors in their whatever, like he removed whatever he had to remove to make them immune from AIDS. And so he did that without anybody knowing, right? He caught all kinds of backlash from the science community. And they say like, man, you just played God. You know, you just played God with two little girls. And now we don't know what's going to happen, right? Because you say this is what you did, but who are you, right? Who are you? Like, where did you get your degrees from? How much research have you done? How much testing, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so now it's just, now these two poor girls are probably going to be some of the most studied people of the next 100, 150 years, you know, however long they live because of what this guy did to them. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, of course, you know, like I said, you know, there was a big backlash. He got in a bunch of trouble and, you know, this was in China. I believe, I want to say 99% sure it was in China. And so, you know, even the Chinese government condemned him, you know, stuff is, like is that. Is scientific standards the same across all nations? Uh, probably not. You know, I mean, in general, I, I'd say in general, yes. You know, but in terms of like the government regulations, in terms of like how a scientist has to do things is different. But I think, I think in general, you know, a, a scientist, an organic chemist here in the States creating a medicine and an organic chemist in China doing the same thing probably have the same end goal in mind. They want to create this medicine to help somebody and you know, uh, impact somebody's life, right? And so at the end of the day, they, they operate in the same way. They write their journals and they put out their peer published science and stuff like that. And it isn't until you get like these rogue scientists who want to do something on their own, you know, kind of like Breaking Bad, I guess you could say, you know, they want to go Breaking Bad and just do things on their own against, against the grain and against, you know, because obviously you get, you know, it's like chemical engineering and chemistry, right? You get all this knowledge on how to create different things and how to purify things. And, and this knowledge could be used to create explosives and dangerous things, you know? And of course, you don't need specifically this knowledge to do it. You can go out and pick up the anarchist cookbook or something and learn how to do this stuff. But they, you know, it's kind of an underlying thing, I guess, and especially for engineers, engineering especially, because engineers build the buildings, bridges, infrastructure, everything. So for them, it's a lot more strict and stringent on terms of like how things operate, right? Everything has to be accredited and checked and double checked and triple checked. But, you know, in, in, in general, I mean, I feel like people are kind of going to willy nilly do what they want. And, but I, I think, in, you know, most scientists, engineers, people associated, and most people in general are trying to do the right thing. Well, you might not know this, but what percent of the population are actually just like considered scientists? It's, I'm sure it's a pretty small population, right? Um, well, I mean, it's kind of hard because, um, I mean, I would assume it's pretty small. And, and like, what do you, and also how do you define scientists? You know, like, I have been a co-author on a journal, right? A published scientific journal. You can go look it up on um organometallics the organometallics journal but and i've done tons of research and i have degrees but i don't feel like i'm a scientist you know like i i wouldn't feel like i was a scientist until i had a phd you know but that's just me you know i'm sure there's a lot of people who graduate with their bachelor's degrees yeah. in stem and, and they're sure like yeah some I'm a people scientist. say you you're you're a scientist if you're in elementary school doing or yeah, yeah. Experience in there, well, yeah, you know? I mean, that's a lot of it. You know, we're all scientists in one way or another. You know, we all try to experiment doing something, especially in the kitchen, right? We're all chemists in the yeah. kitchen, you know? And so, you know, it's a, a broad term, but, you know, I, it's definitely not that many, I think, you know, in terms of like, especially engineers, because engineering is a lot harder coursework to have to endure because it's a lot more math. And I mean, just the just the new subjects you get taught. I mean, you start with physics, you know, your early physics courses, and they say like, hey, these are engineer weed out courses. If you can't handle these early physics courses, good luck in engineering, you know? And so, you know, that's whenever you really have to start to change your mind. Because whenever I took physics one and two, especially physics two, physics two is horrible. But even physics one, right? Because physics one is big stuff. You're throwing a ball and acceleration of the bar. You're launching rockets, or it's, it's the macro. Physics two is the is the micro, right? The, the electron in this circuits hitting this resistor, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so 
when I took physics one, man, it was pretty hard. You know, it was a pretty hard class and I had to study pretty hard. And I think I may have ended up with a C in the class, uh, kind of got messed up on my last test because that's yeah, a whole other story. But so I, I'm pretty sure I got a C in that class. But as a senior engineering student, after I had already for two or three years been doing physics problems, essentially physics problems, I could have gone back as a senior engineering student and blown that physics one class out of the water because my brain at that point at a se as a senior had already been used to thinking in that way and working in that way and, and thinking about um assumptions you have to make a ton of assumptions about the problems like assuming um the thermodynamic process it's going to go through like an adiabatic or isotropic or things like that you know like all these different crazy like a lot of that stuff i don't even remember it's been so long since i've studied thermodynamics and even the professors in the class are like hey when you graduate here you're still not going to know anything about thermodynamics because it takes a long time and a lot of work to understand it so what, what's something about science that the normal person doesn't know um like the normal person that takes for granted but it's really not true whatever well i've learned a lot effect. of crazy things about engineering and my engineering curriculum like in fluid uh, uh, transfer phenomenon, I learned that the the pressure at the bottom of a six foot straw is the same amount of pressure at the bottom of a six foot Olympic swimming pool. Because uh, how pressure, do you even, how do you even measure that? <laughs> well, it's a the, the it's a formula, right? Uh, rho equals pgh, um, pressure, gravity, and the height of the the body of water, and so um. But it's crazy to me to think, right? Right? You could have a straw, a skinny straw, and at the bottom of that six foot straw is the same amount of pressure as an Olympic six foot swimming pool. And because pressure is a, is a, what are they? Is a, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, pressure is a, oh, God damn. Why am I drawing a blank on this? <laughs> it's a, um, it has to do with the depth. I can't think of the scientific term for it right now. But pressure has to do with the depth, not with the amount, with the volume, right? And so that was kind of crazy to me. And then another thing that was crazy to me that I learned um, in terms of heat transfer was that the best insulator in that known to man, the best insulator that we know of is just stagnant air. It's just, you know, you would think like layers of insulation or this R30 whatever material, insulating material would be the best, like no stagnant air is the best insulator that we know of but the second you bring a temperature gradient to that stagnant air so like they say we have a column of stagnant air at 70 degrees fahrenheit and now we're bringing in a heat source closer to that 70 degree air the second that 70 degree air starts to heat up it starts to not be stagnant right it starts to create um kind of um not really waves, but like starts to, to change the way it's oriented. It starts to go because temperature flows from high to low. So this, you know, stagnant air is just still air. So the second you create a temperature gradient, that temperature is going to go from high to low and it's going to start moving those air molecules around. So it's no longer stagnant. So like you basically can't have stagnant air. It's basically an impossibility. And that's why it's like, you know, that's why, um, that's why they say like vacuum sealed chambers, right? You know, you're creating a, a lack of the air in essence, right? There's still, you know, stuff in there. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to mitigate um, the temperature change between the chambers by vacuuming the air out. Because if you don't have any air molecules in there, you essentially have stagnant air and it helps to insulate. So Ricardo, let's talk about the paper you have published. Was that, is that easy to do, hard to do? What's the process on that? Um... I mean, it's a little bit hard to describe in terms of like normal everyday understanding. What we were trying to do was study uh, chemistry bonding and understanding how chemistry bonds to this certain compound. Um, it's been, I mean, this was probably, I graduated in 2016 and I started the engineering research in 2015. So we're probably looking at like mid 2014 to late 2014 is when I really uh, did this. But so basically, there's catalysts. And we, what we were doing was we were taking acetylene. And acetylene is two carbons that are triple bonded. And so we were trying to break this triple bond on these carbons in this acetylene molecule and have one of the bonds connect to this bigger, what we called the PNP um, compound, which was made of platinum, 
and a bunch of other carbons and like it's a it's a bigger molecule so really um it's or it's organometallic chemistry it has to do with um a little bit of organic you know chemistry which is organo and, and a and a little bit of inorganic mechanistry, which is the metallic part of it. So um, for me, it was really a good experience in terms of just understanding how a lab works and working on a research team. Because the only reason I fell into that opportunity was because my professor, um, at the time, she was my organic chemistry one professor. She walked into class one day and says like, hey, who wants to volunteer in my lab to do research? I need someone to help. And I was like, me, you know, like, like, oh my God, research in a real science lab? Like, how cool is that, you know? And for me, I always thought that you had to be offered the opportunities the way she did. I never knew, of like, hey, students can just willy-nilly go to a professor and be like, hey, I want to research in your lab. You got room for me, you know? You just go volunteer. And so, because, um, like, I've always been interested in organic chemistry. Even at that time, I was super interested in organic chemistry. So if I would have known I could have researched just willy-nilly anywhere, I probably would have hopped into a different lab. I still love you, Dr. Han, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, like I said, it, it was regardless. It was a good experience, especially with her because she's no BS. She's from Germany. She grew up in East Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So she's really, really about her chemistry and you really, you know, she's going to make sure things are done right. So it was a good experience, but but yeah, so that was your question, right? Was yeah. our, like just talking about the chemistry in general. Like I said, yeah. the chemistry is kind of tough because it was not really um, anything people use in their. So, day. like I know you see, you don't consider yourself a scientist, but for, from your point of view, what makes someone a good scientist? Or what what characteristics should someone have if they want to go into like become like a biochemist degree? What should they do? We look, look kind of characteristics. Research. Have? Start researching as early as you can, and dedicate your life to it and like for me it was hard because i had kids at the time and i'm glad that i had my kids when i did because had i known what i know now i probably wouldn't want to have kids until i was like 45 because like and i felt bad like you know even whenever i was going and get, doing my undergrad stuff because i was spending so much time doing all the stuff i listed off before and spending little time with my daughters right through their formative years growing up when they were super young I mean, they're still really young and I still do things with them now, but I just felt bad. You know, I was like, here I, you know, in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm going to have these kids when I got out of the military because I want to spend time with them. I don't want to miss out on these things. And I didn't miss out on a lot, but just not being there is kind of a big deal to me. And so I was like, man, like I'm spending all this time doing research and I love it. Like I want to be in this research lab. And it, and, like, and I start to feel bad because like, it's really selfish of me, right? Because my kids want me at home, right? They don't understand any of this stuff. And so I'd say don't have kids, right? If you want to be a scientist, not that you can't have kids, but just understand that. The sacrifice you got to make. Yeah. The time commitment and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cause obviously you can't do science, you, you know, science research at home. Right. And that was one, like, even as an undergraduate, <laughs> we had to use this um, pro program called Aspen, right? It's chemical simulation software. Like basically you can chem uh, simulate a chemical refinery with that software. It's for chemical engineers. And so we could only use it on campus, right? Because the yeah, I'm guessing there's not much remote work. In a yeah, yeah. Community. So it's like super expensive license the school pays for. We can only use it on their network and their computers. So I'm like, man, I don't want to. You know, I spend enough time on campus. I want to be at home and be able to use this stuff. So I went and secured myself a version of that software, and I was able to play with it at home. But it wouldn't give me results, which is important, right? You got to know what the results are based on what you were doing. So I took it to class one day, my senior engineering professor, super genius chemical engineer. And um, at the end of the class, I'm like, hey, you know, can you help me for whatever reason? I was following along on my computer. Everything was working. Everything was fine. And when I hit results, when it's time to come hit results, it won't crank out any results. So I was like, yeah, sure. So I brought it up to him and he's looking at it on my computer and he's like, where did you get this from? And I go, uh, a friend. <laughs> and he goes, get that he started yelling at me he goes get that out of my face right I, I don't, i'm pretty sure he cussed i think he said get that shit out of my face but he was like get that out of my face right now he started yelling at me and i'm like oh, okay you know and i'm over here thinking like man he's gonna be proud of me for taking the initiative like you know, understanding like hey you know i've got a family and i'm trying to at least still learn this stuff at home and he was mad and thankfully that was the end of class because i couldn't imagine sitting in that whole class with him mad at me like that you ever and say why he was mad 
Well, at the end of the, uh, as he was walking out of the class, he, um, he told me, he goes, yeah, there are bootleg copies of Aspen going around in third world countries. And or he said something smart ass, you know, he was just like, yeah, there's bootleg versions of, of this software going around, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, he just kind of, just kind of like, oh no, it's pirated software. Get it away from me, you know? But the really asinine thing about it was like a month later, he loaded up a program and he was like, hey guys, go to your mechanical engineer friends and ask for this CD. I got this from my mechanical engineer friend off his CD. And I'm like, man, you, <laughs> you know, I should have got up and get that out of my face. <laughs> but no, yeah, it was just. Uh, so change the subject a little bit. Um, so your wife is started a, so, so I tell you, you so Hamish, his oh, yeah, uh, chamber. Sn- yeah, the Snohomish. Now, uh, I think before, before we mentioned, talk, came out, I talked about, I didn't know. I thought like every chamber of commerce always formed. Like, is the government did it? I didn't like that people just like really. I didn't really know this could start on chamber of commerce, right? How does that even go? Yeah, well, I mean, I you know prior to learning about this stuff, I didn't even know what chambers of commerce did. You know, like I because I I thought just these business owners who like made it had monthly meetings and you know. I mean, I mean, I didn't know what they did because in our town, we know we had the freer uh, chamber of commerce. And they never did anything, you know, like I never saw them, at, you know, maybe they had a, like a sponsorship every now and then on something, you know, but they were really not very active and, you know, really didn't do anything from what I could tell. And um, so I didn't know anything about it either until uh, I started to do this program, learn about, you know, because I did, I have started a nonprofit organization before. That was kind of like another one of my first forays. I was like trying to start um, a nonprofit that helped during disasters like in a natural disaster because i live right there on the gulf so i was like man when a natural disaster strikes i have all this military training and and stuff and i'd like to help you know so i started this nonprofit, and i unfortunately never got tax exempt status because i didn't have the money to pay for all that stuff at the time and so um learned a little bit about the nonprofit stuff like that and i still didn't even know about chambers at that point but my wife started talking to me about it and i was just like is that something we can do you know like you said like i don't even know you know but there's like there are so many nonprofit organizations. So of like Chamber of Commerce t- is a nonprofit. What's that? Chamber of Commerce is a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a nonprofit organization. I, I, I had no idea. I thought it was like it's like the United States government or federal government. Like, mm-hmm. well, like, I mean, a lot of them I'm sure are funded with grants from the government. Yeah. You know, I thought, like, I thought it was like world. I mean, the United States Department of Commerce or something like that. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. So I didn't know a lot about it either, and my wife was just like telling me about her experiences at work, and then she really blew me away with the statistics. She's like. 30 to 40 percent or like 35 to 40 percent of our students in marysville school district are hispanic and and that blew me away because like i i I would have guessed 10 to 15 at most you know and because i know that the native tribes are real big around here and that's like a big um because they have the marysville to Lalup chamber of commerce which helps the tribes and stuff and so i thought that for sure that there was going to be a larger native population of students you know the the native american students population in the schools and so my wife was like no it's only like you know 15 maybe 20 percent native students and 35 to 40 percent hispanic students and i was just like wow like i would have never guessed that there's that many hispanic students in these schools and so she was like yeah so of course you know their parents are don't speak a lot of their parents don't speak english or they don't know where to go for resources or support you know, they may have small, like there are a lot of small Hispanic owned small businesses there in Marysville, whether that's like a little taco truck or your little bake and shop. So people go, where is Marysville at? What's that? Where's Marysville at? So it's north go. of Everett. It's like 10 miles north of Everett. And it's like, and Everett's like 20, 30 miles north of Seattle. Yeah. And so, yeah. So she just started talking to me about this and she was like, I think I want to start a, a chamber of commerce. And I was like, you know, of course I supported her and I was like, can we even do that? Like, how does that work? You know? And so she started talking and we started looking more into it. And so, yeah, you know, we just, um, we incorporated that right before, right before coronavirus uh, broke out. And it was a really a, a cool kind of thing to work uh, with my wife on because as part of the UW program, the entrepreneurship program, I had to take a class in negotiations. And for the final project of our negotiations class was we had to do a real life negotiation that had real life implications, but not let that other person know like, hey, this is for school and I'm negotiating for a a project. You know, so it's just like, hey, just approach it like you're trying to negotiate something, whether that's you're trying to buy a car, trying to get a raise, anything, you know, just negotiate something with real life implications. 
And so I was like, okay, well, I'll use this opportunity because my wife had already talked about how she um, was in touch with the VP of philanthropy and community engagement or something like that for Bank of America here in Seattle. And she's like, here, I have this lady who writes fat checks for Bank of America and likes to help nonprofit organizations. So how about we negotiate with her about funding this chamber of commerce? So that's what we ended up doing. You know, my wife and I were on speakerphone talking to uh, the lady and we talked to her for probably 45 minutes or so. And unfortunately, we didn't get to negotiate um, any monetary uh, backing or support because we hadn't got tax exempt status yet. She was like, yeah, once I get tax exempt status, then come back and we can talk about, you know, the funding part. But she was really all for helping us get this thing started. And she said that she lived in Snohomish County and she sees a bunch of the little Hispanic businesses and understands because her kids go to school and the Snohomish County school system and stuff like that. So, so what's the plan for the this, this chamber of commerce? Like what's the goal for it? What do y'all want to accomplish? Um, for the community or in the community? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, um, you know, it's going to be a multifaceted thing in terms of like, we not only want to be able to put on like workshops and provide small business support for the local small businesses, but we also want to, like I said, be just, kind of like um, that guiding light, like a lighthouse, you know, just kind of be that, that beacon for the community to know like, Hey, you know, whether I need help with something for something with my kids school, help with something with my business, help with something in just my life or services in general. Cause I mean, that's a big part. I think about um, the Hispanic community in general, we have a hard time asking for help. And I think, you know, I, I don't know if that's a cultural thing or a, you know, a family thing, because my family kind of beat that into me, like, hey, keep your mouth shut. You don't worry about nothing. You just do you. And, and you know, that's why a big part of my growing up where I was just an introvert and kept my mouth shut and kept to myself. And actually, my, my best friends in high school called me shy boy. They would call me shy or shy boy because I never talked. Like, unless spoken to, I probably wasn't going to say anything. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, it was just one of those things. And so personally, what I want to do, what I want to make happen is I would love to have an app made for the, the chamber for our members who, who pay to be a member. So like, let's say, I don't know what we'll call the app, but I would love to have an app that just sh- like, uh, are you familiar with the next door app? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like basically your little neighborhoods and your little, little local area. So think about a, a next door app, but for small businesses, right? That because it's really hard for a small business to create an app or to be listed you know, on a platform or even if they get listed on like Grubhub or something, Grubhub is going to take a huge chunk of their sale for whatever got channeled through Grubhub. So I thought it'd be cool to create an app for like these small mom and pop shops or like the little food trucks or something where they can get on and just let the world know about their existence. Because that's, a bi- I think, a big problem with a lot of these small mom and pop shops in these local little small towns or even in the big big cities is knowing where these little you know hispanic owned or black owned or minority owned com- or businesses are so with this app you'd be able to say like oh, okay look you know it'll basically populate kind of like you know like google maps right you just type something and it'll show up like all the mcdonald's in the map area so i thought it'd be cool to be like be able to type marysville and see like all the hispanic or minority owned businesses in Marysville and say like, okay, this one offers baked goods and this one offers actual Mexican food or, you know, stuff like that. So I really, I think that would be a, a big boost to their business. Cause like, I th- you know, like I said, I think the biggest part about, you know, other than like hoping that you get in a good office space, that's going to have a lot of foot traffic. And then even if you do that, it's probably going to have a higher rent you have yes. to pay. So you know, how many people live in Marysville? Uh, a lot more than I thought. It's over a hundred thousand. Oh, I, had no, I, I thought maybe fifteen, twenty thousand. Yeah, I, I thought it was big. small too. <laughs> and so when my wife told me, like, no, there's like ten schools in this district or something, I was just like, what? I, I thought it was just a couple. Like, I thought because first off, I thought um, because you get into Arlington and like Arlington and Marysville kind of start to blend, and there's like Smoky Point and like all these other kind of little weird suburbs. But yeah, no, I always thought that Marysville was just a suburb of Everett. So I thought Marysville was like maybe 20 to 45,000 people. But no, it's, it's a pretty big city. 
So Ricardo, you're doing a lot with your life, right? Like you have a lot going on. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> on day to day, like how do you like do your like how do you do your schedule? Do you have a calendar you do? Do you just wing it? Like how do you like wake, wake up each day? It's like this is what I'm gonna focus on, this is my priority. Cause I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a problem with like figuring out what to do and how to prioritize the right way. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, they they'll like prioritize one to ten and they'll start working on number twenty, right? Number twenty is not even on your top ten list, right? <laughs> like how do you how do you work through that? It's hard. Um, what I did as a student, because it's even harder when you're a student because you have actual deadlines that are solid. You have to meet them. You have assignments. And you have things you have to do. So for me in school, school was um, Monday through Thursday. And on every Thursday, what I would do, no, I'm sorry, on every Friday, right? So Monday, so basically Friday was my day off. <laughs> Excuse me. So I would, um, on my day off on Friday, I would prepare my week. I would think, look, I would go through all my stuff for school, say, okay, what do I have to do for all these classes? Okay, now what do I have to do? And I would write them down, like, I have to do this by this date, do this by this date for the classes. And now what do I have to do for my small business? Oh, I got to, you know, market, do marketing this, make a Facebook post about this, email this person, try to set up a meeting with this person. And so on Friday, I would just come up with this list of things that I pretty, you know, what I have to do for the week. And just kind of start executing, you know, like, I, I know I've heard it, you know, said lots of times before by lots of different people. And I know David Goggins talks about this in his book about the post-its, right? Just putting your thoughts down on the post-its, putting your post-its on the mirror, and actually doing what the post-it says, right? That's basically the same thing I was doing. And I know a lot of people do this to keep track of themselves and to, you know, keep their crazy life somewhat, you know, organized is I would just write that list down. And that's what I do now. You know, now I don't do it on Fridays. Now I do it, I think, on, you know, over the weekend or on Monday. So I'll just, yeah, I do it, you know, Mondays usually. I try to do it over the weekend because, like, Monday is the start of the week. So I'll write down, like, you know, I got to email Jason or I got to email Renee or I got to do a post for my book or I got to go try to make a cut on my CNC machine and try to make this Fennec case at home. And so... You know, I just create this list, laundry list of things I got to do for the, the week. And then what I'll do is I'll write on the side like today, like things I got to do today and I'll underline it and then I'll just draw arrows right from the long list of things that I put. What do I got to do today? And I'll draw arrows to the thing from the things I, the long list that I made today, draw arrows, right? So then now I know I, I got to knock out today. These other things that I have not marked out, I can worry about tomorrow later in the week. So how do you do this? Like, you know, like some entrepreneurs like work every day of the week, eighty hour hour a week, a hundred hours a week. Like me, me myself, once or twice a week, I'll, I'll I'll make myself take a two or three hour break. Like I might take a break from one to four on Monday afternoon, or three to six on Saturday. Or I work pretty much seven days a week. How do you do your schedule? You do you like take make you, you take two days off a week? How do you do your schedule? No, I mean I kind of especially because I'm a dad and with coronavirus going on, the kids are always at home now, and my wife uh, now she's doing her own consulting thing now. Um, and so I kind of, I kind of do it based on my list is when I take my breaks, like, Hey, you know, you know, I'll do all that stuff. I drug off to the side and I've knocked out three out of the five things I've got to do for the day. Hey, I'll take a small break, 30 minute to an hour break. Um, you know, or play with the kids for a little bit or, you know, try to do, you know, manage my time the best that I can that way. So, yeah, I mean, I just kind of from day to day because I have so many different things going on and nothing really solidified. I just kind of um, do things to take a break as I see fit. And one thing that I did recently, like I was talking to you all about doing my headliner and stuff like that, you know, I, I upgraded the headliner to put 550 LED lights or I'm sorry, uh, fiber optic lights um, on the headliner. So that way it's like a big dance party for my daughters in there when we cruise around. And so like doing the headliner portion of that took me three hours maybe, but like taking all these 550 strands, individually stranding them, poking all the little holes, gluing them all down and doing all that stuff, probably 20 to 30 hours. And I decided to do that because I was like, I need a project that's going to let me turn half my brain off, right? Because I have all these projects that I have to actually think hard about. I wanted to do something where I could just put on some music, put on some YouTube, a podcast or something turn half my brain off, mostly listen to the podcast and just kind of like a, you know, like a robot, just poke these holes, you know? And so I just recently got done with that. And so that's another way I take a break, right? Just give my mind a break. Yeah, I'm still being active and I'm still doing something, but I want to do something where I can kind of get something kind of um, 
proactively done, right? So I'm not just sit there and play video games and turn half my brain off because I can do that. And I do that, do that, you know, pretty regularly every night, right? I do play my video games pretty often at night. But, um, but yeah, you know, like I said, you know, I usually try to get as much done as I can throughout the day. And then I use the evening to unwind when my kids are asleep, just enjoy a whiskey so on ice. And you talk some about your military experience. What about being a military veteran has helped you out being an entrepreneur? <laughs> well, without my military experience, I wouldn't be here right now. Um, because like I said, it really brought me out of my bubble. Um, taught me a lot about myself. And that was really interesting because when I was talking to Renee on Friday, I told her about my experience and because like, you know, obviously my book is a large portion of that. And she asked me, she was like, so do you regret your military experience? And I, I don't regret it. I mean, obviously I wish I had a better experience, but I don't regret it at all because like I said, I learned a lot about myself. I made a childhood dream come true. I, um, and I, I know that I could have done anything in the military, right? Because of my mindset. And like I, like, I was never a strong runner. I, I had never run probably more than a quarter mile in, before I joined the Army. And when you join the infantry, you have to run five miles in under 45 minutes to graduate infantry basic. And so I never thought I'd be a strong runner. And that ended up being the strongest part of my PT test. And like, man, I had cardio. I could run. I felt like I could run an eight-minute mile nonstop, you know, because like that's just a, that's a pretty slow pace, you know, a, you know for infantrymen anyway. For in-shape infantrymen, an eight-minute mile is – not that fast. So I felt like I could have done a hundred marathons at that pace. And so I, I learned a lot about myself. I, it did make me a very ugly person though. And that's one thing that I don't, and I mean, even today, 10 years later, I'm still beating away back the demons that I created uh, back in those days. And uh, I was just not, I can't say that I wasn't a pleasant person because I feel like I've always more or less been the same person that I am. I just drink a lot more. <laughs> and when you drink, it changes you. And so, I mean, I, I didn't drink Monday through Friday because I was like, man, I run and do way too much physical stuff on the weekdays. I will drink on the weekends. But when well, I drink the on the weekend weekends, made up with all the days you miss, huh? Yeah, I, I'd kill a bottle of Crown a weekend by myself. And I'm mostly on a Saturday because Sunday was mostly recovery day, getting yeah, ready for the Monday long. Realize, like, the ones who have no military experience, they don't realize how much in the military, how much you drink in the military. They, I mean, they have no idea how much yeah. you drink. Yeah, it's crazy. And so I was drinking a lot and I was in this really bad relationship and it changed me, you know, it, it changed me pretty, pretty, um, in terms of like how I thought and feel about, um, relationships with like a significant other. And so I became a, you know, like I said, not that I was the worst person, like n nothing like crazy, like, you know, Jeffrey Epstein status, like something, you know, outside, like, like if something got out, I'm going to go to jail kind of thing, obviously. But for me personally, I look back and I was such a horrible person. You know, being like the person you were back then. Yeah. And that's why, you know, like I said, I still fight a lot of the demons from back then. And um, I mean, a lot of it too is just created in the culture of the unit. You know, like that culture was just horrible. And so it kind of allowed the, because uh, like it's really kind of crazy to me because now I hang out with this military veteran and we go fishing on the Puyallup River and I'm like man if I would have just like not been such an alcoholic back then I could have come and fished on the Puyallup and caught like amazing fish and had like all these incredible amazing experiences but I you know infantry mindset young man 21 years old just became a sniper made a childhood dream happen like man I was just wanting to hit the bottle in the bars on the weekend and try to party it up you know and and that's kind of, I mean, that's, I think that's a big part of infantry life, you know, like it's a big part of the infantry culture. And I'm just thankful that I never took it a lot further than a lot of those guys did because guys would go to Canada and get to trouble and like things get crazy. You know, I did get crazy, but I kept it, you know, I, I didn't want to get kicked off the sniper team. So thankfully I had that to at least keep me in check. Right. Cause I was like, I'm in a position I've always wanted to be in and I'm not going to screw this up. Yeah. So um, thankfully that helped keep me in check because I didn't want to. So I remember up. seeing this Facebook meme the other day and talking about the culture of drinking military. The Facebook meme was, Hey, the Sergeant said, you know, go to PT and in BDUs. Mm -hmm. Oh, that means step as lazy you want and drink as much as you can. Cause there's no PT in the morning. Right. I had a friend, man. Um, he would actually put vodka in his canteen and he'd be there on duty and like, Man, oh, I got one for you. 
back when I was at E5, this we there's the E seven right. I'll never forget this. He actually told us this right, like this was his his lesson to us, right? How not to get caught drinking. He said, <laughs> drink vodka and then after because it doesn't smell whatever, and then yeah. after that, eat peanut butter. Oh God. That's his lesson to us, right? <laughs> as young junior E fives, the senior said, in order you know, in order to get caught drinking, like I don't know, drink vodka and, and eat peanut butter afterwards. You never get caught. Yeah, I mean this guy, like obviously there was a lot of people in the during the the ramp up for the war on terror that should have never have been allowed in the, the military. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I had a friend who was just, he was so bad with the drinking. And I remember I went to his room one time and he was like, man, I have a headache. So he took like five Tylenol PM. And I'm like, dude, you're going to fall asleep at work. Like you just took five Tylenol PM. He's like, no, man, when I want to fall asleep, I'll take like 10 or 15 of them. And I'm just like, what? I'm like, you're like, man, you got to, you know, go to sit call, take care of yourself, man. Yeah. And uh, he's actually, I didn't learn about this, about how bad alcoholism can get until like later I got out and I started watching um, intervention. And um, so basically, you know, alcoholics can get so bad that they're literally bleeding from their esophagus and they're ruining their lining in their throat and in their nostrils and stuff. And so he was always blowing out bloody. I mean, he had bloody snot on the roof of his barracks room, right? He was blowing snot, bloody snot everywhere. He was always bleeding and always like, and I always, always tell him, like, man, go to sit call. You, you like, sit call is there for a reason. Go, man, go. I'm worried about you. Like, no, no, I'm good. And, of course, he eventually got medically discharged. And, um, and so it wasn't until years later that I saw intervention, and they were like, yeah, I drink so much that I, my snot's all bloody and stuff like that. I was like, wow, that's how bad this guy was. Like, he was literally a And then we had this one guy in Korea, same guy. You know, we do you know, the exercise in Korea, like, all the bigger sizes. This guy would hide liquor bottles in the computer, right? Like he would he would take the computer, the, the big computer, he'd take the computer that put a, put liquor bottles in there. Oh wow. <laughs> and then one time this same guy, we had like we'd like do Aussie PT like once a month, right? Like four or five in the morning. And he would like be like, you know, smell like alcohol, would, like, you know, either like you've been drinking all night or you took a couple of shots this morning. Like it, it both are bad, right? What are you doing with yourself, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, that that whole drinking definitely made it hard for me. And then the just the the culture of that place made it hard too, but you know, I don't regret any of it. Like I said, I, I learned a lot about myself. I made a childhood dream come true. I made it to where I could, you know, self-employ myself now. Cause you know, that's basically what I did as under an undergraduate student was um, doing those handgun classes. And if, you know, I only made like maybe eight to $10,000 a year doing those handgun classes. Cause I did them when I wanted to, and only when I needed money. And, um, but there was guys, uh, other people, like there's a Navy veteran who does it there in Corpus Christi. And when one of the mass shootings happened, he ended up getting 300 students in one month, um, you know, right after the, um, one of the mass shootings. 300 students in one month at $100 per student. So, yeah, so you can make a lot of money doing that handgun instructing stuff. And it's a really, you know, it's not, it's less than $1,000 to do for veterans to, up front, you know, to pay for it all. And so, yeah, I could have made a lot of money doing that. But for me, it was just about, you know, continuing to work through um, the traumas of military service and just kind of do my best to be a good dad and student. Ricardo, what advice do you have, like a brand new entrepreneur, someone just now started on the entrepreneurship journey? Um, I'd say read business books because they definitely help. Um, find mentors because I mean, mentorship in any aspect of anyone's life is, excuse me, is very important. Because, like I said, without the mentors in my life, um, Mr. Earwood and my squad leader, the first squad leader that I had, because I was a 240 gunner when I first got, you know, put into the to that unit, and so I was on weapons squad 240 gunner. My squad leader was an ex marine, high speed dude, love him to death. Um, and without his guidance and his leadership, man, I would have never been ready for that sniper team. And like, and like, and I'm really thankful because there were other squad leaders in that platoon that I was a part of that were not very good. And have I, and had I been one of their soldiers, like I probably wouldn't have reached the success that I reached. And so Sergeant Hendo, he always uh, expected the most of us. And that, I mean, and lugging around that 240, man, that will get you ready for anything. So <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not light. Yeah, that's for sure. 
So um, I'd say, you know, on top of the mentors, on top of the books, you really, you need, oh, I, I'm going to say this too, because this is something that stopped me, right? This is something that I didn't learn until the last um, bit of the program. You have to do things that don't scale. You absolutely have yeah, to you do hear that. Oh, you hear that over and over again. Yeah. So I'm like the biggest do things that don't scale, um, you know, cheerleader now, because like, it's another one of those powerful tools that you don't understand, like a network. Like I never understood the power of a network. I never understood the power of doing things that don't scale. So whatever your business is, you might think like, oh, I need to perfect it to where it doesn't look like this because whatever, whatever, like I need to make it to where I can scale it. Don't worry about that. You need to worry about doing things that don't scale because you just need to get something out so you can get feedback on and start making better. And at some point, if you get enough things out that don't scale, you're going to create revenue for yourself and allow yourself to be able to move on to something that's going to help you get towards that scalability. So for example, the story that really turned it around for me was um, we had a very successful entrepreneur come and give us a talk in the program. She talked about how you know she joined this startup company early on, one of the first employees, the CEO of that company eventually left, she became the CEO of that company and led them to an acquisition or something, right? So she became a successful entrepreneur by leading like, like she didn't even have the idea or start the company, right? She just was lucky enough to fall into those spots. But she, you know, became the CEO led it to a successful exit. And she talked about how now like, once you become a successful entrepreneur with an exit, you have credibility. And once you get that credibility, that's all you need. So she was talking to us now about how she has this pl new platform. And on this new platform, they raised $2.5 million for it. They don't have a revenue model. They don't have any customer profile. They don't have any idea how they're going to market it. Or I mean, I have a general idea of how they're going to market it. Because of reputation, what she's done in the past. Mm -hmm. But because she has that track record, somebody was happy to write her a $2.5 million check or a handful of people to fund this new startup. And she talked about the startup and she said like, you know, it's basically like an Angie's list for the Seattle area. And it's like, you know, a lot of people from the Seattle area get on this platform, put down like, hey, I had this plumber and, and it's by invite only. So you can only get into this platform by invite only. So it gives it that more of a friend kind of feel and you can trust these reviews and these people. So she said like, hey, we have this platform. These people do this. You know, people gets a sim someone gets a swimming pool built. Like, hey, great swimming pool review. Hire this company. Well, one guy went on the platform looking for a basketball hoop installer. I guess he wanted a basketball hoop at his house. And so she was like, "Well, damn, nobody's ever put anything up, right? Nobody. That's not something people do very often. So they didn't have anything like that. So she's like, I had to do something that doesn't scale, right? I saw that he had searched basketball hoop stuff on the platform when I got on that day, and we didn't have anything. So I reached out to him and I said, Hey, I see, I saw that you searched this." I know we don't have anything, but I'll, I, will do the, I will do the research for you. I'll call around, get some quotes, you know, blah, 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 and I'll let you know. So she is like, that doesn't scale, right? Obviously, if we have a, a million users on this platform and I see people looking for things that we don't have, I can't hit them all myself and offer that same service. So like what I did doesn't scale, but I had to do it to help this customer to learn more, to get, get this other product on my platform, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I built this relationship with this customer. Now he's going to come go and tell other people like what I did for him, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so she's like, so you have to do things. And I'm like, and, and then when she said that, I really reflected on myself and like, who am I to, to be like, I don't want to do things that don't scale. You know, whenever here's this rich, successful entrepreneur who, are, who is still doing things that don't scale and is a multimillionaire. So I was like, I have no excuse anymore. I'm going to do things that don't scale, you know? So I say that's a, a big thing is do things that don't scale. It's going to seem really weird and it's going to feel wrong maybe in some aspects, but do it and learn and grow from there. Ricardo, can you share your social media for yourself and your, and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, sure. Um, my Twitter, I don't use very often. Um, it's uh, Twitter slash the real Kemja. Uh, the T H E real R E A L and Kemja C H E M J A. So Kemja was just a, a word I came up with. It's a mix of chemical and ninja, right? I feel like I'm a, when I graduated, I'm like, man, I'm like a chemical ninja now. So I'm just going to make this word up Kemja. And so, um, yeah, so at the real Kemja on Twitter, um, you can follow me on Facebook uh, at my page. 
uh, Facebook slash PG for page slash Ricardo Perez author. And or you can just look me up on, on Facebook, send me a friend request too. I'm happy to add to my 350 friends. <laughs> and um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, I think my LinkedIn is um, Ricardo Perez 36. You know, the LinkedIn, I think it's like slash IN slash or maybe slash profile slash. But yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn too. And my YouTube, I have an old YouTube channel that I don't have control anymore. And I'm really sad because it's about to hit a million views um, for all the videos that I've put on there. But that YouTube channel is um, youtube.com slash xxbigballs36xx. And I, it's a bit embarrassing of a link, but it's my gamer tag, right? My Xbox Live gamer tag. And I made it in 2010, um, right? I was just like, hey, I'm in the army. I put these videos up, add me on Xbox Live. So that's why I made the channel like that. So that way people can add me on Xbox Live. And um, my actual YouTube channel now, let me make sure I get this right. I know it's like YouTube, um, your channel. Yeah, yeah youtube.com slash Ricardo Perez should be the link. Okay. And for our listeners, we have the links to all the social media in the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and your network. So Ricardo, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice and wisdom, anything you want to talk about? Um, you know, one more thing with the entrepreneurship part that you were asking about a new entrepreneur, I'd say it's really important to be fearless, you know, number one, we, it, you have to get uncomfortable. You know, that was one thing the army taught me, right? The army makes you uncomfortable in many different ways and you grow as a result of it. You grow as a person, you grow as a soldier, you grow as a leader, get uncomfortable. It's going to help you grow and get to school, right? Whether you can afford to pay for classes and actually get a degree. And if you can't, there are a billion YouTube videos from Ivy league schools about business and everything you could ever want to learn. And what I'd highly recommend when coronavirus is all over, go to your actual local universities and go to their business, um, their business departments, you know, their, their business schools, and just start talking to people. I mean, that's kind of, like I said, the secret to success. When I was going to school at UW, I was hitting every department that I could to talk to people and be like, look, I have these ideas, because like, I also have a tons of other like novel science ideas. So I was looking for um, material scientists. I was looking for um, people who do uh, simulating the like traffic simulation because I have an idea to help mitigate traffic. So I was like, I had all these ideas. So I was just going to these different departments and networking with these different people. And it ended up being a really cool thing because like, you know, I now I'm, you know, a really good acquaintance with, um, I think he's the director of strategy for the Institute of Protein Design at UW and the Institute for Protein Design, they have Nobel Prize winning work going on in there. And so to be able to go in there and meet these people and talk to them just because I was a UW student was a great opportunity. So I say, if you're a student, use that student card, go all over your campus, talk to as many people as you can about as many different things as you can, build that network. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, I was fortunate enough to have the GI Bill and able to go to school on the GI Bill. And I know not everybody has that, but, you know, you can, you can show up in classes. You can sit in on classes for free. What's it called? I think it's called auditing classes. Yeah. You know, I actually did that with this program before I got in, you know, to make sure it was something that I wanted to do. I sat in on a class and the class I ended up sitting in on was a class led by a venture capitalist. So we got a class by a venture capitalist in that program. So she's telling us like, hey, you know, I'm, I like to write checks and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, she literally told us like the first day of class, you all need to really think about scalability and stuff because I like to write checks. I just wrote a check for the last cohort, you know, for someone from the last cohort, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, especially if you live in a major city with a, with a great business department, like the way Foster Business School is, like, man, the people that work there and the people you meet there are just world class, like. One, one more quick example about how awesome that university is before we roll out. Um, so in the program, we're learning about leadership. Our leadership professor gives us this uh, article to read. And it's written by this woman at Harvard. And it's a great article. And so I don't know if it was later that quarter or maybe the next quarter, because we had that leadership class through the whole program, four different quarters of it. 
And he's like, hey, guys, you'll never guess what. I was getting, you know, he's a faculty for this, the, the university. So I was like, hey, I got my faculty email. And they always let us know, like, hey, here's our new hires. So I was going through the list of the names of the new hires. And he's like, and I recognized this name on this list. And he was like, oh, she's the woman who wrote that article and UW hired her. So he's like, I had to email her right away. So I sent her an email and I asked her, hey, we just read your article in class. We're doing leadership, entrepreneurship, you know, blah, blah, blah. Do you mind coming and talking to the class about your article? And so there she was, you know, a few weeks later talking to us in class about the article that she wrote and we had read a few weeks prior. I mean, it was just kind of weird to me, like, wow. Like this university is so awesome that they scooped up this woman from Harvard and now she's in my class reading me the article we literally got assigned written by her, you know, so it was, it's an amazing school. It's an amazing opportunity. Any way you can get into the UW uh, system, whether that's Bothell, Tacoma, uh, you know, like I, I graduated from Texas A&M University, Kingsville, not the full Texas A&M University College Station, you know, the full, you know, the actual Texas A&M. So you know, I know there's a lot of stigma with going to the colleges that aren't the, you know, the main campus, but as long as you're getting a good degree and it's accredited and you're learning, man, go out there and get that education because it's super important for growing as a person, growing as an entrepreneur and learning about business. Ricardo, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jason. It was fun. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.